Good morning, everyone. This is Superintendent Marcus Eddings. Are you hearing me clearly? We are. Thank you, Superintendent. We can't see you, but we hear you clearly. Yeah, I, my um, video cam, my web camera is not working properly. I'm sorry. No worries. Um, and then actually, why don't we test the sound in the meantime also for um, Superintendent Hassan and uh, yeah. Superintendent McColdrick? Yes, I'm on. Uh, Madam Chair, can you hear me? Hear you loud and clear. Same, some, some type of other issues. I don't know what, what's going on there. All right, well, I can hear you, fine. And okay. Superintendent McGoldrick? Good morning, all. Good morning, great. We can hear and see you. Great. Um, and, and from the department, are, are we still expecting Lisa O'Brien as well? Yes, Lisa will be here, yep. Okay. Hey, Flynn. Thanks, Councillor Bach. Hey, hey, Julia. And, and Elise the other day said, oh, look at Flynn. He doesn't have on a suit. Yeah. And the I, other day you did it either and she noticed it and she, um, she made note of it. <laughs> well, it's casual Friday here. Yeah, it's casual Friday, yeah. Yeah, it was so funny, the things that young kids pay attention to. All right, I've been told that we are now ready to go on the technical side. Um, so we are gonna get going. Let me just get my list up. All right. All right, Candace, are we all good? We are all set, Councillor. Great. All right, I'm calling this hearing of the Boston City Council's Ways and Means Committee to order. For the record, my name is Kenzie Bach. I'm the City Councillor for District 8 and also the Chair of the Council's Ways and Means Committee. This public hearing is being recorded and live streamed at boston.gov slash city dash council dash TV. It will be rebroadcast on Xfinity Channel 8, RCN Channel 82, and Verizon Ch Fios Channel 964. Um, we will be taking public testimony at the end of this hearing. So if you want to testify via video conference, please email Shane, that's S-H-A-N-E dot PAC, P-A-C, at boston.gov to sign up. Uh, and we ask that when you're called, you state your name and affiliation or residence and limit your comments to no more than two minutes, just to ensure that all comments can be heard. Uh, and you can also submit written testimony by emailing the committee at ccc.wm that's for ways and means. So ccc.wm at boston.gov. Today's hearing is on docket 0213, order for a hearing regarding Boston Police Department overtime. Uh, this hearing is a 
it was filed this winter, but it was originally filed last July. Um, and it's a effort uh, by myself um, and counselors Campbell and O'Malley, my co-sponsors along with the whole council to really track where we are on the budget commitment that we made in the city's FY21 budget to hold the police department over time to $48 million for the year. Um, and given the kind of overall fiscal pressures that we face, the needs of all of our departments, including lots of our civilian ones and, and the recognition I think in the city that um, you know we wanna be shifting work that is better done outside of the police department um, to other shoulders and, and help our police officers focus on police work. Um, you know, we really are trying to shift these resources and make what we budgeted for effective. Um, so we've been holding these quarterly overtime oversight hearings uh, to focus in with the department on how those goals are being achieved and where they're coming up short and what we can do to remedy that. Um, so we had the last one of these in November um, and uh, we'll be getting an update from the department um, and, and asking questions and all today. Um, the Joining us from the Boston Police Department today is Superintendent Marcus Eddings from the Office of the Police Commissioner, Superintendent James Hassan the, from the Chief of the Bureau of um, Administration and Technology, and Superintendent Kevin McGoldrick, um, Chief of the Bureau of Field Services, and also Lisa O'Brien, the Deputy Director um, for the Bureau of Administration and Technology, and the Department's Chief Financial Officer. Um, so I'm grateful to all of them for joining. Um, I'm mindful, I know the department has a time limitation today. Um, so that means that I will be quite um, strict with colleagues just about uh, time windows so that everyone gets to ask their questions. I'll go very briefly right now to my two co-sponsors, but then I think we'll dispense with opening statements so we can jump straight to the department's uh, questions, uh, sorry, the department's presentation and then our questions. Um, so uh, Councillor Campbell, um, if you'd like to say a few words. Um, thank you, Councillor Bach and O'Malley for the continued partnership on this issue. Of course, thank you to uh, folks from the department for being here and for con your continued work every single day, especially in the midst of COVID. Um, and you summed it up. This is just a, a conversation where we continue to think about one, how we actually um, reallocate resources to the root causes of violence so that we are more effective in our response because police alone, of course, can't do it. But also when we commit as a city to save a certain amount of taxpayer dollars um, that we actually actualize that. In order for that to happen, of course, we need a plan and a strategy. So look forward to working in partnership with the department to get that done. So thank you very much, Councilor Bach um, and Councilor Malley. And thank you to folks from the department for being here. Thank you, Councilor Campbell. Councilor O'Malley. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Superintendents and Deputy Director for your uh, partnership and work here. Thank you to my co-sponsors, the Chair and Chair of Public Safety as well. Um, I'll waive my opening statement so we can get right to work. Thank you very much. Great. Fantastic. Um, and now, Superintendents, I realize that I don't know which of you to defer to who's first amongst e equals here, but um, I, I don't know, Superintendent Eddings or Hassan? Or okay. uh, Madam Chair, I'll start this morning. Uh, First of all, I want to, uh, th you know, thank the Madam Chair and the members of the body for uh, allowing us to participate in this um, discussion. And uh, like, like uh, the Madam Chair said, my name is uh, James Hassan. I'm the superintendent of the Bureau of Administration and Technology. Today I have, I asked, um, asked and they graciously accepted my request uh, Superintendent McGoldrick, who is the uh, Chief of the Bureau of Field Services, uh, and Superintendent Eddings, who is assigned to the Police Commissioner's Office, but is responsible for court and the detail unit. So I know the uh, intense interest from past uh, hearings that the uh, Council had in these particular topics, so I that's why I requested their, uh, for them to participate. Uh, we do recognize the importance of working within our budget, but also we recognize the uh, importance of maintaining public safety, which is our primary function. Um, you know, we've been trying to obtain both of these goals, but we have faced many challenges over this last year, as you all know, and you've experienced them yourselves. 
you know, with the uh, pandem pandemic and, um, you know, social and political issues that have created increasing demands on our services. And uh, um, we've also particularly experienced an aging workforce as well as a uh, increase in violent crime. And I must say, under all those demands, we have performed admirably. The, uh, we are currently at 9.3% below our budget from last year. But unfortunately, because of those demands, we are 43% over the budget that was uh, expected for us to reach. So, uh, you know, in that, those overtures were caused by those challenges that I met. Uh, I'm glad uh, Madam Chair and Councilor, um, the Councilors have mentioned, um, you know, ways on how we can obtain these goals. And, uh, and that is to, um, you know, to coin a, a term alternative policing. We need, because the citizens of Boston have come to rely on the BPD to supply, uh, you know, provide them with uh, the services that they expect and demand. And until we can start um, putting them, you know, uh, in incorporating other agencies to pick up the slack or uh, the demands of those calls that they right they rightfully should be going to. Because over the years, this is like a snowball effect. Over the years, we have collected a lot of uh, activities that we should not be participating in. And I think the way we're going to uh, achieve, we need, uh, it's a full, you know, it's a holistic, we're gonna need a holistic approach to achieving this goal. So all departments in the city are gonna need to step up and help out. But with that, um, like I said, I wanna uh, welcome and thank uh, Superintendent Eddings and uh, Lisa O'Brien who's a uh, uh, very loyal uh, person to work with and, um, and with that, we'll we'll start the meeting. So, Superintendent, just I just I see that I just got data from the department um, uh, just a few minutes ago. So I'm having that sent out to the whole council. But do you guys have any any presentation or? or well, we have uh, several papers. I, uh, we sent that to you. Uh, I don't know what happened, but we did uh, forward that along yesterday. Okay. All right. Somehow in the chain of command, it just, it got to me, uh, it got to me this morning. Um, so we're sending that out to everybody. Um, uh, okay. But you don't have these up on slides, do you? No, we don't. We don't have it on the slides. Nope. All right. Well then I, um, I will, uh, I'll start my own timer and, um, actually let me just check with Shane. Have you had a chance to send that out to the counselors yet? Uh, I'm in doing it right now, Madam Chair. Okay. But it should be uh, out. Okay, Shane, you're having trouble with your connectivity, but um, but that's fine. So counselors should get the information from the department momentarily. Um, I will uh, make a, a a chair attempt to improvise um, and ask a few questions about the the headline um, superintendent, and then. Um, go to others and I'll go first to my co-sponsors, um, Councillor Campbell and Councillor O'Malley. Um, so, so the, it looks, um, Superintendent, sorry, let me just pull this back up. Um, so I know you said, so it looks like we've already passed, am, am I accurate that these FY21 numbers that you sent over to us are, they're, they're not, um, they're not Those sort of are, projected forward. They're what's actually yeah. been spent so far, right? That's exactly like that, that. Those numbers reflect everything up to February nineteenth. So, as you can see, we're six hundred and sixty thousand hours into the fiscal year twenty one, and the budgeted uh, or expected was seven hundred twenty seven. So, seven hundred twenty seven thousand. So we're fast approaching uh, that number. Yes. So. Uh, you right. can see that. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. No, so I, you know, just to assist with the, uh, as 
the other councilors get the information. So the replacement costs of that, and uh, that is um, for fiscal year 21, it's 287,607 hours, which is 43 and a half percent of the budget. If you compare that to fiscal year, so I'm not, I just don't want to start repeating to get people confused, but. Um, if you compare that to last year, fiscal year, replacement costs were about a third of 36%, right? Of our overall. Exactly, exactly. So, and, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. No, so, I mean, so with that, we have an increase of uh, 22,000 uh, 926 hours, which is, you know, which really driving our costs, our overages, and it's 8.7% over uh, last year. So, uh, and, you know, and that's due to many reasons because of, you know, the COVID, uh, we were, high, you know, severely affected. At one point we had over 300 offices out of work because of either, um, you know, exposures or actually having COVID. Um, so, um, you know, also we have, uh, we've had numerous retirements, uh, which, you know, so for the fiscal year 21, we had 102 from uh, July to February. Uh, compared to last year, uh, fiscal year 20, we had 126 for the entire year. So we're, we're uh, losing people left and right. We still have the issues of uh, people that are out on uh, injured MIS. So, you know, we're vigorously working to get that under control. We've uh, recently hired another, you know, this COVID really put us back on our heels because, you know, everything became virtual. The officers were seeing their physicians virtually. The, uh, they were seeing, you know, our medical staff virtually. And so it really slowed things down, getting people back to work. So, uh, you know, so which, but now that we're starting to emerge, we recently hired an, uh, an individual that's going to, uh, we're going to start seeing patients, you know, offices again, make sure that they're receiving their, uh, the treatment that they need, they're on track. So we're going to start to, so hopefully we're going to start to see some of that. We've also started, you know, we've worked with the retirement board, some of these people that have been on injured long-term. We're uh, moving in that direction to uh, retire them, to get them off the books. So there's a lot of, lot of things going on that um, are affecting that replacement cost. But that's basically the, um, what's the, you know, the main factor of our overages, so. Yeah, so am I right though? I mean, to me, it's, so the headline here, right, is that we've basically, we've already spent as of the end of February, the 48 million that was budgeted um, for overtime. Well, we haven't quite spent it yet, but we're about to, so. Right, but we, we'd almost spent it by February 19th, right? So probably by now we have. Yeah, um, yeah. So we're so we're basically at all overtime from from now to June thirtieth puts us in the red. Yeah. Um, so just so we're forty three percent over expected budget. Yes. Right. Um, which sounds awfully like getting close to, and I think you said it was just moderately down. So for folks reference at home, the budget for the prior year was sixty million, um, and the and the um, reduction to that in the in the FY twenty one budget was. 12 million down to 48, but the actual overtime amount in, um, in FY 20 was 72 million. So it sounds like, you know, you're, we're on track to be at what 65, like what's the, when you said you gave us an initial number as superintendent of the percent down, you thought we were below last year's budget. Yeah. Um, well, I didn't do the, um, what's projected at, but uh, I can just tell you what we have at this moment. Yeah, okay, but I, I just mean- You know, it's, it doesn't look good though, because again, the re between the retirements, which are coming fast and furious, it doesn't, uh, you know, 
we're, we're going to be look, looking to replace our personnel. Right. So I wondered if we could speak to specifically, and this might be a question for Superintendent McGoldrick, I'm not sure, but um, uh, the, I mean, when we had you guys in November, it looked like there was a sort of almost a hundred officers worth of replacement costs kind of covered by this additional bubble of folks on long-term, you know, sick or injury leave. And, and my understanding was that that mostly did not include COVID folks. Um, and so I, I hear you saying we've got another doctor on board. We're going to hopefully be able to process these more quickly, but, um, but I would love to hear from the Bureau of Field Services, whether, I mean, that struck me. That's, well, that's, the other, the that's the done a is, big driver. Yeah. So the other thing we've done, we've uh, contracted with the uh, a medical group in Brighton. So it's, and, uh, you know, a couple of different medical groups that we're sending our offices to. So we, again, we have a, a multi-pronged approach to addressing this issue, so. Right, no, I hear you, but I think obviously it's very frustrating for the council to be here. And I was hoping that we would be instituting these, some of these things earlier in the year to get this, this really unusual bubble in the um, number of folks out on second injury leave down because um, it seems to be really heavily driving that replacement cost. Um, I've I've run my first round timeout. Counselors should by now have these numbers in their inbox. I'm sorry that it sounds like the department did something last night and we just um, collectively, they didn't hit my inbox until this morning. Um, so, uh, so I think those should be with all counselors, but I wanna go on um, to Counselor Campbell. Counselor Campbell, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Councillor Bach, and thank you again to the department. I guess taking a step back, because I didn't get the numbers and haven't had adequate time to review them, and I will, of course. If we could just go back, and maybe this is a question for you, Chair, what was the original commitment from the administration? Where is that number now that actually has to be realized to meet that commitment? And where are we currently in terms of the numbers? Because I was a little confused at the beginning. Um, so that would be helpful. So. I'm sorry, what's, what's the question, Counselor? I'm sorry. I, I, where it, it's the overall question of where we are relative to the. Um, uh, here, you know what? I think it's going to be most helpful if I just, if I throw up this um, front page on my sheet. So give me one second. Uh, this one is called section one. Um, and, and Councillor Campbell, I won't count this against your time. No, it's fine. <laughs> um, if I can find, uh, oh, come on. Um, here we are. Okay. Are folks seeing an Excel right now? Yes. Okay. Okay. So basically what the department just sent over is to say that, um, so if you see uh, last year, our entire replacement personnel hours were, tw were uh, you know, 260 odd thousand. And this- Madam Chair, could you make that maybe just a little bit bigger? I'm sorry. Yeah, sure. Is this, is this better? Is it zooming when I do this? It is. That's okay. better. Thank you. That's better. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Um, okay. So basically, uh, so basically, the headline here is we've already um, had twenty thousand more replacement personnel hours in the partial FY twenty one than we had had in all of FY twenty, um, which means that uh, we're you know we're we're going we're going over budget first of all clearly and we're due and it's driven most heavily by these replacement personnel hours. Um, I think that's fair to say. I think that's pretty much what the superintendent just said. Um, if you go down here, uh, you can see that um, the, so thus far we've had um, I see. So the overall budget, this is the overall budget was a, was a total of 727,000 hours coming out at $48.8 million. Um, and uh, 
and this would have been the average hours per week. So about 14,000 hours a week to hit that. And instead we're running at 20,000 hours a week. Um, so uh, do you have calculated maybe Lisa or somebody um, uh, the um, sort of the total spend rate on the, like what, what's the total number that we've spent on overtime hours so far this year? Year to date, the total actual hours year to date is the 660, 650 up top. That's as of February 19th, which is 33 weeks into fiscal year 21. Um, I mean, obviously, as, as you had said, Madam Chair, replacement personnel is really driving that overage. Extended tours was helping us significantly offset that negativity in replacement personnel. Um, at one point, extended tours was 16% under compares to the actual amount last year. However, because of the unforeseen um, political outcome and the, the amount of people that we, and some of the protests that we had during the week of election, it, the, that amount clearly um, was driven down to 3.7 point percent. Because if you look at elections, ele the election week cost um, the department 62,000 hours or approximately $4 million in overtime costs because our offices were put on 12 hour sh shifts. Um, all days were canceled um, that week, the week of the election of November 6th. And that's specifically that election week. So do any yes, of that's that all election week. Got it. So election week drove us up $4 million. It drove us, because we were depending on, I mean, like for example, at one point our replacement costs like early by the end of the summer was relatively flat compared to last year. And then again, we, as everybody knows, we, we had the uptick in the coronavirus beginning in September and we got hit again by that, which drove the replacement cost up. Um, plus some of our offices, as you know, are going out injured and we can speak to that later on as well. But um, the offset was coming from extended tours because that's roughly weighted equally with replacement costs, but we lost that once the election week can't come. So we went from 16, percent um, down compared to last year to now um, roughly 4% down compared to last year. Yeah. I also want to mention too that the 72 million that we ran last year, 4 million of that is being moved off um, to the COVID grant into FEMA. And I also like to point out that part of that 72 million, and I don't have the number in front of me because I can't pull it up because of the sharing screen, but of that 72 million, there was a significant amount of money spent on the mass cast area, along with the protests, which dro drove us to that 72 million. Uh -huh. um, yeah, I think we'd seen those numbers from you previously. I just wanted, so can I just ask a quick question, Lisa? I know this is back of the envelope, but I noticed down here you're using a, a, a $66 an hour factor for these cost numbers. That's the so average. So right, I know it's it depends on the officer and their rank and everything. But is so would it be accurate to say just for Councillor Campbell's zoom out question, if we've spent six hundred, you know, sixty thousand, six fifty hours so far, if I do that average factor, I come out to about forty three point six million. And if you carry that out and back out some of these unforeseen to, uh, events to get a true run rate, because you know some of the unusual event items that you'd want to back out, such as the, the amount that we spent on protests and the amount that we, you know, we're hoping as far as we don't, you know, any demonstrations going forward. But if you back out what our run rate would be had we had not had those unforeseen events, such as the election week, you know, built, you know, making sure that every, you know, we had public safety in place. I'm, I'm saying we're probably going to come in about 63 million for fiscal year um, 21. So you're saying that we would be at 63 if we didn't have the if we hadn't had the election, roughly, uh, unless unless yeah, we make an aggressive push to get our offices back to work. I mean, our, our run rate, our, year, our weekly run rate for average hours is is 20,000 hours a week. Even if I back out the unforeseen events, it'll come down slightly. But uh, I mean, I'm not. I'm saying if we keep running. At that run rate, that's where we'll end up, and it's it's replacement cost is driving driving that significantly. Right. It's it's these. It's like I mean, right. If you're replacing a hundred officers worth of folks every week, that's a lot of that's a lot of budget. Uh, but but just to be clear, the sixty three is where you're projecting we'll land with elections, or it's where we would have landed without elections. I know it's 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 including the elections. I'm just saying I, I like for example, if I'm going to project out 
the, the following weeks, the remaining weeks. I don't want to use in my run rate yeah. the number. You know, I back that out, go forward, and then add that back in. Okay. So just, but just so that would be Councillor Campbell to answer your question that it sounds like on the department's projections, we are currently running 15 million above budget. So the so the budget for this year, let's just say, was 48 million. That was the that was the budget then the like where we're kind of landing based on this current is 15 million over that at 63 and then well, i just want to take a step back just for the lay person that's watching right that is like what so they're not confused so the the administration commits to saving 12 million dollars right in overtime in order to realize that what num what is the number that we would have to save in order to realize that 12 million because we, you know, it did go up. So that's my second question. What is Does yeah. that make sense, Councilor Bob? No. Well, no, so the challenge, so the four, 48 million was the total that we would needed, uh, we would have needed to hit in order to realize that 12 million and save. That's it. my question. Th so that's my question. We yeah. commit to 12 million, but to realize that we'd have to save 48 million. No, we wouldn't have to save 48. We'd have had to, oh, you're talking about compared to the, or like, com because we actually ran way over the prior year. That, that's exactly right. Got it. So, so what it was, was FY20. Okay. Sorry, everyone that we're doing this on the fly here, but FY20 actual was, and I'm, these are obviously round numbers was actually 72 million. That's what it was. And then the, and then it's probably worth saying that FY20 budget had been at 60 million. And yeah, but so, you have to back out the COVID because that was replaced. So, so right. it's 68 and then, million. And then you're saying the COVID, co so you're saying money that we got from the feds yep. was 4 million, right? 4 well, million. About yeah. 72 million was moved off the operating budget by OBM. How much of it? Four of the, se of the 78? Four, 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 four of the 72. Four of the 72, right. So, so our actual budgeted money spent on FY20 without the federal money was 68 million. To achieve the FY21 budget, Councillor Campbell was million. hit 48 million, which was, and we've talked about this before, right? Is that it's it's a 12 million reduction from this 60 that was budgeted, but it's, a, and it's an effective 20 million, 12, 20 million reduction because of how much over budget right things ran so however it sounds like what the department's telling us today is that we're on track so our fy21 on track is 63 million which means that we wouldn't i mean which means that we're actually over um the we're, it would have a saving effect of 5 million off of actual for last year, but it wouldn't have a saving anything over after budget. It's actually over budget. Even for FY20, it would have been over budget. So it's- But, but do, you, do, you try, do you get what I'm trying to get at for the person who is just you know, high level trying to understand this, not as in the weeds in terms of replacement costs as we are, so we commit to saving 12 million, but based on on track of where we're going, right? What would we actually have to save to realize that? At this point? Yes. At this point, the department would have to stop having overtime hours because it's, it's already spent $43.6 million, right? So, and that was as of February 19th. So we've probably spent, there's no, there's, I mean, what I hear the department telling us today is that if unless it stopped having any overtime hours today, it will not hit the, the budget target of 48 million. That's correct. Which to um, say the least is disappointing. Right, so that, that, that's my, that was my final question, right? Which is sort of where are we with respect to um, hitting that, that, that commitment, right? Um, that we made as a city, so. Okay, that's that's helpful. I always want to just break it down. So the average person watching has a sense of, so the average person watching has a sense of what we're talking about, if that makes sense. Then my, my last question, because I do want to be mindful of other colleagues. I thank you, Councillor Bach, for going through these numbers because I just got this 
during the hearing. So I hadn't had a chance to review. So thank you. But um, my one question, this has come up in previous council hearings, and then I, I can wait to the next round, is we've talked a lot about, and, and officers have brought this up, you know, reassigning re, uh, folks from the gang unit, from the bike unit, from the youth violence uh, task force, strike force, back to the districts as a way to help us cut down on overtime costs and to provide the districts with the coverage they need, especially the busiest ones, with the coverage they need in order to respond to the number of calls they're getting. Where are we with that? Have, has the city or the department made it a commitment um, with respect to, to that? I know we talked about it and it's come up in a couple of our hearings thus far. Uh, yeah, so we've earnestly tried to uh, obtain that goal, Councilor, of the 48 million, but due to those challenges, we were unable to. So as far as um, that plan that uh, you've discussed previously, we, uh, given that the uh, demands of the crime, we thought it would not be, you know, because our, our first uh, commitment is to public safety. And I mean, in our crime okay. that will bear out how successful that these units are. And uh, we just thought it, at this point, it wouldn't be uh, prudent because it would, it would cause us to fail at our mission. That, that's the problem. So I guess in short, it, no one from the bike unit, youth violence task force, gang unit was ever sort of reassigned to go back to the district to provide coverage to some, say some of our busiest districts based on some of the upticks in calls and violence we're seeing? Well, they're, they're assigned in those districts, just not through um, the districts themselves. They're special, they're okay. Okay. That what was they call question. overlapping policing, so. And, and yeah. I guess then my last question is, what strategies, if any, because we've talked a lot about different ideas, including, you know, assigning back to the districts, the gang unit, youth violence uh, strike force, bike unit to provide more coverage. We've talked through various ideas that haven't actually happened. So what strategies did the department try to do in order to realize anything um, in terms of the overtime? That's well, my our goal. Council, I mean, our strategy is to uh, work feverishly and getting these officers that are out injured back. That's, that's the, uh, I think that would obviously save the uh, necessary, you know, replacement costs. So that's, that's our goal. And we've, like I said, we've hired and we've done multiple things to try to realize that goal. Um, thank you, Councillor Campbell. Um, yeah, I, I, yeah, I just, I, I'll just underscore that. I mean, the answer that we're finding out today is that we're not achieving any of the savings that we had hoped for. So um, I'm gonna go to Councillor O'Malley. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so obviously, you know, I, I think one cost driver, as has been mentioned, is, is when an officer is out because particularly he or she may have been exposed, either tested positive for COVID-19 or been exposed. We recognize the fact that, that Boston police officers can't work remotely and, and our first responders and, and at risk. Um, so obviously that has been a factor for the last 12 months. But I'm curious, do we know the percentage of uh, officers that have received at least one dose of uh, the vaccines as of today? We have about uh, 1,800 employees uh, vaccinated approximately. We're waiting for the second round and we're hoping to get more, but you know, a lot of people, some were skeptical, you know, they want some took to wait and see, see, you know, see how others make out. So I think they're realizing how effective it is counselor. So there are yeah. uh, more people want to get it. So. Good. I mean, I, I would. Counselor that they, they all received their second shot. Those that the superintendent is speaking of yeah. have all received their second shot. So they're considered fully vaccinated at this time. So 1800, and those are um, uh, off front, front facing officers, or is that sort of a mix of some of the administrative staff as well? It's a mix of the okay. uh, 911 call takers, officers, some of the uh, frontline civilian employees. Gotcha. And, and I would just urge you and any any 
city employees or any citizens of the world who expect, expect uh, express uh, concern or cynicism about taking vaccinations. I hope we can all underscore in the strongest per possible terms how important and safe it is and how crucial it is that we take it. We encourage our colleagues to take this, uh, get this vaccination as well. So that's neither here nor there, but since you had mentioned some concern that some officers might have um, I get it. It's just it's we need to we need to do this, and and these are safe, and these are effective, and these will save lives. Um, secondly, uh, on one, I again, I know you'd sent this information. We're just getting it now, but on one of the uh, spreadsheets, I think Lisa, you had sent it's um, part one, section three, details. Um, do you have that available? It's on the second tab. Administ. Uh, I'm sorry on the third tab under receivables. Okay, it, go ahead. It, it's got, so it's got fiscal years, you know, 16 to 20 that are all virtually in the same amount. And then for 21, it's 3.1 million, 75% of what the total is. Um, you, there is a note that much of the amount is not yet due. Is th So that's, that's what a private vendor would pay us and we're just waiting to collect. Yeah, so it's, 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 it's what the receivables are now, meaning what has been billed but not paid. But a lot of times, um, a good chunk of those receivables are made up of the utilities such as um, NSTAR, National yeah. Grid, Boston Water and Soar, and they, they pay. But, the, but by the way, the bills go out, it's, they're not considered like um, due, not within the 30 days. So that's really not, it's not an unreimbursed amount is, is what I'm saying is that amount will go significantly down once we get payment from um, the utilities and they're the, the biggest, uh, biggest vendors. You see them out digging all the time. Sure. And a yep. lot of times it's because within the actual, um, company itself, they all have every single digging, um, is a project for them. So it has to go through the various project managers for approval, but they do pay. So that, that amount will go significantly down. I would not really, it's, it's just a number right now of what we have outstanding, but it's not, okay. um, you know, beyond 90 days, beyond 60 days. Like it's not at a dunning notice. But council, that does that does raise a problem, an issue of some of these contractors do not uh, pay. Yeah, and no, our budget is on the hook for that. Yeah, I totally get that, and as I mentioned at the last working session, uh, I will reiterate today. It's any way we can be helpful. I mean, it would seem to me that if there is a vendor who does business before the city and is not paid their fiduciary or fulfilled their fiduciary obligation, there absolutely should be some recourse with the city of Boston as it relates to permits, as it relates to other work. So I do think that is an important conversation to have. I just wanted to get the point that of those three point one million dollars, which will obviously grow because we still have two and a half or three and a half months yeah. left in the fiscal year, you would, I would assume, Lisa, this looking if past his prologue, that all but about 200,000 in change should be collected by the end of the fiscal year. Yes. And, and I, I just want to point out that the um, detail unit that rolls under finance, yeah. they do a tremendous job with collections. Um, actually, we've been called to many meetings within the Treasury Department on our process because of how we can get the receivables down, the cold calling that we do. And it, you know, we're, we're acting like a collection agency, and we do have yep. various conversations within the departments that issue the permits, such as um, inspectional services, transportation, and uh, Boston Water Resort to kind of flag some repetitive vendors that refuse to pay. Ideally, okay. um, if all systems talk, it would be great. Similar to when you go to the registry, if you have a pass due parking ticket, you can't renew your registration. It would be great if our, all of our systems within the city talked so that, you know, Joe Smoke comes in for a, a permit, pops up that he ho owes a significant amount yep. of receivable, go down to the third floor mezzanine and see treasury and pay your bill before we'll issue the permit to dig. With you completely, Lisa. Sorry to cut you off, but my time is limited. Oh, sure. And I think That's we fine. will have to follow up on that um, in okay. the next ones. When it, it relates to two more questions, when it relates to sporting events, obviously they're starting more with a significantly reduced um, audience capacity. Has How is, is that then in turn affected? And I understand that these are private uh, vendors, but do is the allocation of resources commensurate with the reduced um, reduced audience or, or crowd size? So yeah, instead yeah, of yeah. sending 100 officers to patrol or to, to assist with a championship uh, Celtics game, we send 10 or 15. Probably Superintendent McGold. Yeah, that's, that's, that's worked out with the uh, vendor counselor. OK. And, you know, and it's, you obviously, like, you, like Lisa said, uh, Superintendent McGoldrick has a um, takes a, bit, a large role in determining that with the vendor. So I, I assume the answer is yes. We're saying because it's a yeah, uh, different. Yeah. 
yeah, great. Okay. And then finally, has there been any discussion? You had talked about how extended tours have helped. I brought up on several times with these conversations, looking at the shift change experiment, which would indeed has, has been proven enormously successful in other cities. There seems to be a lot of appetite for it. Um, has there been any further discussion with that as it relates to rain and some of the costs as it relates to overtime? It, no, it, it, we haven't, Councilor. Okay. All right. Um, that's all for now, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor O'Malley. Um, next up is Councillor Flynn, and then just so councillors are ready, it's then Asabi George and then Mejia. So, Councillor Flynn. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Block. I've been following this issue very closely and following this hearing very closely, but one thing we, we haven't mentioned is we don't have enough police officers on the streets of Boston. We need to hire, as I've said for the last three years, we need to hire several hundred more police officers that will address the issue of, of forced overtime that's happening. Um, you know, we're, we're going into the budget process season. As a city council, we're going to effectively advocate for an additional, you know, several hundred more police officers. I hope, I hope we do. As the superintendent is saying that, you know, we're having a lot of police retire um, at high rates. Well, because we're having police officers retire at high rates, that means we have to make up the difference. And, and making up the difference means hiring full-time police officers instead of asking for uh, forced overtime. Um, so I think as a city council, we, we need to do our responsibility too in advocating for additional police officers on the street. This pandemic hit us all hard. It hit the police officers very hard. Their families very hard. Uh, they got they got COVID and they were exposed to dangerous situations. Um, when they have COVID, what is important is their their health, their family's health. Um, so I think we need to work differently. We need to work smarter and more effectively. Um, you know, as a district counselor. I'm, I'm on my, I talk to my police captains all the time. I want more police presence in my, in my district. Um, I'm, I talk to Captain Sweeney and Captain Boyle and Captain Fong who just retired and Captain Triolo, but I'm asking for, for more police presence in, in my district. And I know probably other district city councilors are too. Um, how could I, how could I say I want more police officers on the street and then say, I want to cut forced overtime. And the forced overtime is the, the, the officers have to work that particular shift. So I, what, what I'm saying is I hope we have a serious discussion next month about hiring many, several hundred more police officers in the city of Boston. And I just want to say thank you to um, my colleagues. Thank you to the police officers, the superintendents that are on. Um, and thank you for giving me the time. I don't, I don't have any questions. I just wanted to highlight my, my concerns that I had. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councillor Flynn. Um, before we go to Councillor Asabi George, I do just, I think I neglected to say at the beginning, all the colleagues who have joined. So in addition to myself from District 8 and Councillor Andrea Campbell from District 4 and Councillor Matt O'Malley from District 6, um, we also have, as you just heard, Councillor uh, Ed Flynn from District 2, Councillor Anissa Asabi George at large, Councillor Julia Mejia, uh, at large, Councillor Liz Braden, District 9, Councillor Michael Flaherty at large, Councillor Michelle Wu at large, Councillor Lydia Edwards from District 1, and Councillor Ricardo Arroyo from District 5 are all here. So I just wanted to read that into the record before, uh, before we go. Um, uh, all right, so uh, Councillor Asabi George. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. And I, I do wanna actually ask the question, I think that Councillor Flynn was uh, proposing what is the sweet spot for the additional number of police officers we need to hire in order to sort of find that right nexus between um, not having and running large overtime budgets and making sure that we, you know, because we, we appreciate and understand that the reason we don't hire uh, new police officers is because it's a cost savings piece. It's cheaper to, to force overtime um, or offer overtime, but hiring um, would limit some of that overtime. So is there an app more appropriate number in which the, the force should be? 
Yeah, Councillor, so, you know, it, it is kind of a catch-22 for the police department. Uh, we end up uh, obviously being criticized when we spend overtime to, to get to the, the levels that we, we feel we need to serve the, the residents and, and the visitors and everyone else in the city uh, appropriately. So, I mean, for, for a little bit of history, there's, you know, there was a city ordinance that was enacted back in 1980. I think it's still on the books that, that sets the number at no less than 2,500. It was a, a federal grant that, uh, that required us uh, upon acceptance of the grant to commit to uh, 2185 as the number uh, into 2016. Um, right now, our number is um, is less than that. It's uh, 2067 with the academy class will be uh, 2160, but there'll obviously be retirements between now and then. So, so we'll be hovering around the uh, 20, 2100 mark, relatively speaking. So, so there, there's obviously, that, that there's some room to, to say that if we were, if we kept back to even just the 20, uh, 2016 commitment that we made to the federal government uh, as a condition of the grant, we, we'd be a little bit light. Obviously, if you look back historically, uh, in 1980, when the 2,500 number was set, the population of Boston was about um, 563,000. Now it's, you know, 695,000. The, uh, the 911 calls, if, even if we just look back to 2011, was... Uh, 418 plus thousand, uh, 2019, the 911 calls was 681,000 plus. So, you know, the population, the workload, I think all indications would, would, uh, would point towards a, a higher number. Uh, obviously, there's a variety of methodologies of how one would establish what the right number is. There's, there's no agreed upon method, method to say, this is how we'll decide how many police officers a city should have. You know, there's a per capita method, there's a workload method. Uh, so I a think understanding sort of that analysis would help lead this discussion, I think, in a better way. And certainly we can, you know, there'll be disagreement and dispute about what that right number is, but understanding some of those formulas and that analysis would be very helpful. How many police officers right now are out injured or out for various reasons? Is that number about 300? Is that, is that accurate? Uh, it's in that range. It's probably probably three hundred plus, but but yeah, it's and, and certainly that's that's a work in progress. But that that definitely impacts. You yeah, know, it's two two hundred and seventy with two hundred and twenty at MIS. So that's that's the number right now. Is there an yeah. opportunity to bring any of those police officers back to some sort of light duty or reduced capacity? Yeah, yeah we we again, council. We're trying every uh, aspect to bring them back. Uh, one thing that we're doing is trying to, some people that have been out long-term is to uh, involuntary retirements to get them off the books, which will open up uh, employment opportunities for people who want to do this job. So that's one thing that we're bringing people back light duty. We're increasing medical visits. Um, you know, so we're doing, we're doing everything, believe me. And I know uh, Councilor Bach said that they would have liked more progress, but this COVID really has put us on it. Like medical doctors just weren't seeing people. It was all virtual and it really, really slowed things down. But we're, you know, we're hoping you know, most of the uh, employees have been vaccinated. Uh, we're hoping the city starts loosening up some of those guidelines that allows our employees to come back. We'll be able to see, uh, patients firsthand, um, or officers firsthand. So there's a lot going on there, but in a lot of opportunity to uh, make room for others. Great, um, I, do, I appreciate that. I see that my time is up. Um, Super, I think it's Superintendent McGoldrick. I'd love to, uh, at some point um, offline, look at that analysis and understand how we can get to at least creating a conversation around, around um, the appropriate sized uh, force and, and how many um, members we we could have depending on some of the analysis. I do have Madam Chair questions for the next round. Uh, so I'll uh, wrap it up here. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Um, yeah. And I'll note that several times the committee has asked for um, sort of more explicit formulas on how we get to those minimum force numbers. So it was helpful. Some of the context you just gave superintendent, but I also think it's something we're going to need to continue to dig into. Um, next up is Councillor Mejia. Um, then uh, I had I had placed uh, Councillor Arroyo in the wrong place in the order, so it'll be Councillor Arroyo, then Councillor Braden, then Councillor Flaherty, just so people know. Um, Councillor Mejia, you have the floor. Thank you so much, um, 
Councillor Bach and the sponsors for bringing this conversation and to the administration for being all in. It's important for us to dialogue. Um, I'm more curious around, um, I've heard from a lot of uh, officers' wives in particular who are really concerned about the um, mental well being of some of our officers, particularly those who are overworked. And I'm just curious, um, how is the um, department responding to, to those needs in terms of um, just the overwhelming um, mental uh, impact, mental health impact that over time has on some of our officers? Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure, yeah, and, and that is a concern that, that's recognized. We, we do have a, uh, a very probably probably one of the best peer support units so resources are there for, for people that are experiencing mental health challenges as a result of what, whether it's the workload or perhaps some of the conditions they face relative to uh, the anti-police atmosphere or, or, or anything else or, or some critical incidents they might be involved in so, so we do address that but I recognize that certainly the more people are forced to work the more people miss time to connect with their families and friends and community because they're forced to work extra hours uh, sometimes without any real notice that does have an impact on, on mental health and uh, and unfortunately we don't have a great plan to limit those hours, limit those ordering um, situations. We, we did shift some people around in the past to try to mitigate that. It, it helped somewhat on the margins. It wasn't a dramatic difference in the, the amount of people that, that we could uh, that we could order because it, there's, there's so much work to be done and there's uh, only so many officers. So it, it is a concern and I certainly appreciate you recognizing that and, and having uh, conversations with, with officers' family about that. Uh, we continue to work on it. We continue to try to limit uh, the, the amount of times we order people, but, but I do recognize going forward, you know, for the foreseeable future, it, it will be an impact and we'll do the best we can to mitigate that. Yeah. Do, you, do you see any correlation between uh, being overworked and then just the, the performance? Like, does, do, you, do you, have you heard or seen, um, or, or do you have any data about how the overtime, the overwork, how it impacts performance? Well, I mean, I don't have any data that would indicate that, that it's resulted in, in a, a um, diminished performance. Uh, you know, our, our, our stats and, and the, the way we've conducted uh, ourselves as a department, I, I think, is, is probably a model for others. I mean, we, we really have avoided the sharp increases in crime. We really have been able to take a huge number of guns off the street without without having to resort to uh, to force that would that would be objectionable or that would put you know the public or even the suspect or the police officers in danger. Uh, we've been able to transition to a very methodical, careful approach, uh, and, and that all takes some you know some careful attention to detail, some supervision, and some mental uh, alertness. So I think we're uh, I think we're doing well performance-wise. Having said that, it, it's, I'm sure mental health professionals would say there's no way it's not affecting you know people at some level, whether, whether it's at work or, or elsewhere. Yeah, thank you for that. And my last question is, um, oh yes, go ahead. No, Councilor Superintendent Hassan, how you doing? Uh, no, and we do have provisions within the rules that limit the amount of hours mm -hmm. that an officer can work on a daily basis. So that so we do take that. Um, you know, into consideration that to ensure that they get proper rest and uh, time with their family to the best of our ability. But the demand, we don't have the opportunity yeah. to pick and choose. So sometimes the demands are great. Sometimes they're not so demanding. So, but we do have provisions on uh, daily and monthly hours that they can work. Thank you for that. And my last question is um, kind of just want to piggyback a little bit on what Councillor Campbell was referring to and that it would just be helpful um, to get a better understanding in terms of where the greatest needs are. Can you just help me understand a little bit more about like, how are we allocating um, support? I, I'm thinking specifically around some of the violence in, in certain neighborhoods. Um, are there ways that you all are partnering up with others to, um, Maybe I think we talked a about deploying mental health and wellness um, providers. Are you, are you looking at other ways to help support some of these communities that have seen a higher uptick in violence and looking at partnering up with the Boston Public Health Commission and other um, city agencies? To yeah, absolutely, Councilor. 
Uh, I'll, I mean, I'll let uh, Superintendent McGoldrick, but this is people are uh, the front line uh, emissaries with the, with those types of issues. But and we also have the uh, Bureau of Community Engagement. But uh, you know, and you know, we've as you know, we're working with the best teams, and we we work. You know, we try to work with other city agencies, state agencies, mental health. Um, you know, uh, community groups. Uh, you know, nonprofits. We believe us. We are doing everything possible to reduce that violence because that's uh, you know, public safety is really our main concern. So, and we'll do whatever we have to do to obtain that goal. You know, and create whatever relationship partnership to achieve that. So, Council, we've, uh, in, in terms of specifics, we've uh, nearly doubled the number of officers assigned to the street outreach unit, and we're working uh, diligently to hire more best clinicians so we can give a, uh, a public health approach. We're working closely with the, uh, the public health on that. Uh, we're revising our the way we handle Section 12 commitments, so that'll be more effective and it'll be, it'll be a more coordinated approach. And the intent is that will uh, allow us an opportunity to uh, enhance relationships with, with providers outside of those who we usually deal with. So I think that will be effective. Uh, and of course, the trauma teams uh, are deployed with, with street outreach workers whenever there's a, a traumatic event, a homicide or a significant uh, violent event in a community. So we, we, we are still working those issues. Obviously it's been a challenge with uh, the COVID situation, but we do try to maintain our relationships with the community service officers and the, uh, the various faith-based organizations and community groups. Uh, hopefully we can turn a corner on COVID soon and, and enhance those relationships back to where they were pre-COVID, but, but that, has been, uh, that has been maintained as a, as a key component of what we've been doing and, and we've been expanding it. Uh, I will say that some of, the, um, some of the issues regarding the police being extricated from things that people don't want the police involved in, some of the mental health things, uh, has not really resulted in less police involvement. It has just resulted in, in maybe some greater partnership. So you know, as, as public health may increase their capacity, that doesn't decrease our capacity. You know, for example, when, when EMS is dispatched to a emotionally disturbed person call, they almost always request police to accompany them due to past incidents and potential for violence. So, you know, that there is talk of maybe creating some, said he says created a, a third agency that would dispatch mental health professionals. The police fully support that. I think that would be a great thing. I just don't see any results in terms of lessening the, the role of the police as much as we would all like that. So, you know, if that's, if that's something that can be on the agenda, not, not just increasing mental health and public health roles, but decreasing the police role, uh, I'd love to see a way to make that happen. And I see the gavel. I see the gavel, Kenzie Bach, uh, Council Bach. I'm all good with all my questions and thank you so much. I'll continue listening. Great, thank you so much, Councillor Mejia. Um, all right, next up is Councillor Arroyo, then it'll be Councillor Braden, Flaherty, Wu, Edwards, just so people know the order. Um, Councillor Arroyo. Thank you, Madam Chair. Is it possible for you to put the numbers up that we were looking at earlier? Just, I, I think for the public, it's easier for them to reference that when I'm, when I'm speaking on these questions. You're, you're muted. Sure, yep, one second. Thank you so much. And then uh, if you could just zoom in, it was like having an eye test where you're like, is this right? Is this right? Like, but and, the last one, the blank I have, stuff. I have been told that if that there may be an issue, it may be, or wait, now I, that's the wrong one, isn't it? Yes, stop sharing. Um, uh, there, it may be a little bit blurry on the, on the stream. Um, it's apparently showing up fine uh, on the recording. Like, so it'll be, no, that's, is that still the wrong one? Do you guys see the right thing? Is that the one we were just looking at? I, I think that is, but I think it's zoomed because uh, I think there's more. Oh, to roll out, that's right? not the right one. Oh, there you are. Yeah, that is. It's there just am. you just got to zoom out a little bit so that it's so that it's, it's all showing there. Yeah. Um, do you so want actually, to... for me right now, if you could just go down to there, you go. Perfect. Uh, perfect. That's exactly perfect. Thank you so much. Yep. Um, so, couple questions off of these numbers. Uh, we're forty three percent over. Uh, is it safe to assume because we haven't had court trials and things of that nature that court OT is actually significantly down? Yes, Council. If you see in the uh, third one, yeah, from the uh, right. So that's the two point four percent there. 
77.6% down on court, yes. And so on a regular year, you would have had court costs up. And then special events is actually sort of tracking close to the 9%, which I'm, which is a little surprising because we didn't have the Boston Marathon. We didn't have, you know, any of these parades. Is that what, what accounts for all of the special events? Is that the elections? Is the elections included in special events? Yes, the, the, the elections and some of the protests would, would all come through the, the special events budget code. So, so yeah, they're, they're not special events in the way that we would typically uh, think of them in, in, in a regular year, but that's, uh, that, that is funneled through the, the same code. Okay, thank you. That's actually helpful. And then uh, in terms of the elections, I, I have some questions here about elections. I see that there are $4,132,706 on this, and I'm assuming that that's not just for the cost of having officers stationed at polls? That, that's correct. And so I think I heard that they were out the whole week. Is that true? The whole week of November 6th? Correct. And so what exactly Our, was that? Was that was on 12-hour shifts too, Counselor. So, so when you say that though, what does that mean? Because they're not manning a polling station. So where were they? What, what were we doing with these officers at that time? They were assigned to areas where there could be potential uh, unrest or confrontations with varying groups. Based on the election? Is that what, that was the idea? Yeah. It was, yep. And so did this happen pre-election day or post-election day? It or started, a mix of both? Go ahead. Go ahead. Or did a mix of both? Because I, I realized that if it's a week, it could be a couple of days before and a couple of days after. It could be entirely the week after. It could be entirely the week before. What, what time frame was that? So we started a day of uh, election and, and went a couple of days after that. And, and we also had additional people out around the, the time of the inauguration as well. Okay, so, so a lot of that has to do with the idea of civil unrest due to the election results? Correct. Okay, uh, and then the gang cars, I, I see that. I don't actually know what a gang car is. What is a gang car? Just so that folks who are watching this know what a gang car is. Yeah, that's that's probably not a, a, a great name for it. It's just additional um, additional assigned patrols or assigned fixed posts. So it, it could be, I mean, theoretically it could be as a result of gang violence, but it could be a result of any violence. It's typically, typically violence related, but we also do have coverage for, um, and, and it would be looped in, into that um, probably inaccurately named category. You know, we will start to see, as, as I'm sure maybe some of you have already received complaints from your constituents, we're starting to see some of the ATVs out on the streets. And, you know, we, we haven't seen too many of the uh, the, the low rider, um, um, you know, people racing around the streets, although we did have a horrible accident in East Boston um, the other night. So, you know, as, as the weather gets nicer, COVID is not going to be resolved completely by the summer. So I anticipate we'll, we'll see people congregating uh, on ATVs and, and with different cars and, and just trying to enjoy themselves. However, that gets to be a problem in the community if it exceeds the capacity uh, for the different areas to absorb that, that type of activity. So, so we would dedicate um, resources to those areas um, a lot of times at the request of, of uh, some city councilors or others in the community and that that would be categorized as a gang car frequently even though it's it's really not related to a gang appreciate that uh breakdown and then in terms of uh i don't see uh and it would be helpful to know we keep talking about forced overtime how what's the percentage of actual forced ot within the ot hours so a lot of that is actually voluntary overtime. I think the vast majority of it, the last time we had that data breakdown at the last hearing, how much OT is actually forced, is actually not by choice, is, is, is how much oh, of that OT is actually the counselor, case? Counselor, the, uh, I think we did forward that information. If uh, Counselor Brock, uh, Brock could, yeah. so you could take a look at it. All right, I'll, I'll have that for the second round then because I'll try to find that in, in this. It's, it's there. Roughly right now, February year to date, the, um, the overtime that was forced is approximately 82,000 hours. And how much is the non-forced? 595,000. Okay, so is that, is that 
does that mean that it's over, it's around 700,000 hours total? Am I reading, is that an under, am I understanding yeah, that? Correct, correct, about 700,000, correct, counselor. So what would 80, 80 out of 700 be in terms of percentage? More than 10%, 12%. So really forced OT is really just 10 to 12% of the entire overtime hours, which is significant, uh, but it sounds like it's not the vast majority of that over time. Yeah, sorry, yep. Counselor, Counselor Arroyo, I'm just showing it here so people can see this is what the department sent us is, this is the There's February another. year to date overtime and the no column is not forced and the yes is forced. Counselor Buck, there's another one that we sent you. It's a uh, two pager. Oh, I'm sorry. No, that's the uh, OT hours worked and not worked. Never, I'm so, sorry about that. Yeah. So that's, that's helpful. Thank you. And then just on the injuries, which this might end up having to be a second round because I want to be mindful of time. But just on this one specific thing, do we know how many injured officers or out officers are actually out due to contracting COVID or COVID protocols? Do we know what the percentage actually is? as opposed to all the other injuries, how much of it is actually COVID or- COVID. Yeah, we have those numbers, yeah. What, what percentage is, do we have those numbers? Did you send those those as well? I know we just got, I know we just got them. I know you sent them yesterday, but do we have- no, we, uh, we, didn't, but we weren't asked that. We didn't provide those numbers, but we have those. I, I can get that for the next round, super. Yeah. Thank you. That would be very helpful. And I'll, I'll save all of my injury stuff for the, the next round. Cause I think there's, you talked about forced retirement and things like that. And I kind of want to explain and understand what that is. Um, I just heard the alarm go off. And so I want to give you a little heads up of what my next round will be. Uh, so if, if Lisa or anybody has to pull out these things, um, I want to know about forced overtime, uh, not forced time, overtime, forced retirement, what that process looks like. Uh, and I'm also going to be asking about how you calculate this. We still, we're talking about increasing staffing without even knowing how you calculate hours, how you calculate how many people have to be at a protest or a rally. We don't have any of those formulas. And so I, I'm certainly interested in how you calculate all of those, those issues uh, if we're gonna be talking about upping or, or lowering police numbers. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I'll, I'll see you on the second round. Thank you. Great, thank you, yes. And I'll, and I'll just say, obviously, anything we don't get answered today, the committee will be following up on. And also I'll be taking you know any questions counselors have since folks just got the information now as they sort of look over it in the days to come um, since that's some pretty striking um, stuff. Um, all right, I'm going now to next, sorry, I'm looking for my list, uh, Councillor Braden, and then it'll be Councillors Flaherty, Wu, and Edwards. Councillor Braden. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I don't want to steal Councillor Arroyo's thunder, but I, I had a question about um, how many officers are out on long-term sick leave uh, I know it mentioned that there were 220 officers out on sick leave, but how many of those are long-term uh, sick leave? And uh, again, what is the process to expedite the retirement of those officers so that we could hire replacements who are graduating from the police academy? Okay. So I don't know. Um, long-term, I'm not sure... Um, you know, but we, we have um, 220 people out injured and we've selected a uh, number. Anybody with two and a half years or more on injured, we're moving to involuntary retire them unless they have some really specific, uh, special circumstances that will convince us that they're able to return to work. And uh, the process is very cumbersome and and uh there are many barriers and obstacles due to the state laws and uh other issues associated with uh doing that and we're uh, addressing them as we come you know encounter them but so generally what we do is the process is is uh if someone has been determined that they're most likely not going to be able to return to work and perform as a full-time police officer and all the functions and duties that are related. We submit, we, we gather all the information. There's a package that we submit to the retirement board. And um, with that, there's some um, really, you know, arcane rules 
associated with that, notifying them via uh, certified mail, and we, we do all that, and then we we bring it to the, the retirement board, and if it's if it's not exactly right, then it will kick back, and um, we have to restart the whole process. It's very very uh, cumbersome, but we have right now twenty two people. Uh, that we've submitted paperwork since the first of the year that we're going to involuntarily retire. Um, we just feel that they're not going to uh, make it back, you know, and um, and we're, and we're working on others. Like I said, we've, we've selected uh, two and a half years and above. And like, so uh, that's, that's the process. I mean, it really is, if you really want to talk about it, I don't want to tie everyone up. It's, we could, I'll, um, meet you and talk to you about it and show you the process and very difficult. Yeah, I appreciate it. Um, I'd also like to point out too that once it does get to the retirement board, it's also another lengthy process on their end to process things. So once the package goes up to the retirement board, it's, it's, it's a lengthy process that they have to follow to get them seen by a third uh, panel of third doctor, a panel made up of three doctors, they have to go before it has to get reviewed by Peric. There's a hearing, so it, it is an extensive process on their end as well. So it, it it's it's a lengthy plot process on on both ends to get it right. off their own and in involuntary accidental disability. Yeah, and there's, there's actually it, it, two it, ways to go, counsel. Go involuntary accidental or involuntary regular. And so we you know we've learned along the way that we need to do both at the same time because if you were denied involuntary accidental. The whole process starts all over again. So and it takes months and months. And is the process triggered automatically when someone hits a two and a half years or do you have to, do you have to be, um, you know, intentional about, you know, thinking, oh my goodness, we need to look at this. Uh, it's getting yeah. out of hand. Yeah. No, it's it not. That's just, a, that's just a, like a, like a, um, just a ballpark. It's like something that we just, start to look at of course we take you know it's really the information like there's some people that go out in two months and we, right away we know they're not coming back so but uh so we could start with those the, you know if, a lot of them uh those type of pe individuals they actually uh you know enjoy our assistance with that you know they they appreciate our assistance but you know, so two and a half years, we'll start looking at what are all the issues around this person and, you know, what does it look like? We'll start making an assessment. If it looks like they're probably not coming back, then we'll go down that road. Is that a supervisory role that, you you know, um, their superior officer would, would have a conversation with them to be more to thinking along? OK, what do you think? Are you going to be coming back? Is it time to start thinking about applying to retire you know rather yeah. be more proactive in that process rather than just waiting for it to trigger yeah well they, they yep there's well that's what the uh, whole point of the uh, medical staff kind of has that and you know that's the whole point with this covid really set us back i don't, I don't want to keep blaming it but it's the truth so we're going to have more in-depth conversations with offices as they as we're able to and start discussing their cases individually with them. Yeah. Um, okay. You know, and the other side of that is that we, we really, uh, you know, set our intention to diversify our, our force and bring in new recruits who more women recruits, more people of color to have a more linguistically broad group of, of, of folks in, in the force. So, you know, the, the positive side of that is, and I understand completely that it's a very emotional decision to retire from a force that you, you've been um, a faithful, um, you know, officer and ser served for a significant length of time. It's a big decision to make. But once you're, if you're not able to perform the job, then it's it's time to think about that retirement. Anyway, Correct. thank you so much. I thank understand you. it's a really difficult issue to, to consider. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, Councillor Braden. Um, Next up is Councillor Flaherty, um, and then uh, Councillor Rue had to go, so it'll then be Councillor Edwards. Councillor Flaherty? Thank you, Madam Chair, um, and uh, thank you, Council Park Campbell and O'Malley for sponsoring, co-sponsoring the hearing. Uh, I'm uh, first want to say I'm 
grateful for the work that our Boston Policeman uh, Plus Police Department does across the city, uh, particularly the great work they've been doing throughout the pandemic uh, and also uh, their um, immediate response to the over 700,000 calls that come in from everything from A to Z. So, um, you know, as the department continues to work towards Mayor Walsh's goal of a 20% reduction over time, this uh, hearing obviously is giving us the opportunity to check in on the progress and, um, and also try to determine the best way forward in reducing um, the overtime budget um, without seeing a reduction in, in key services uh, that would make our city any less safe. Uh, that's one of the um, strengths that we have as a city, our community policing and the fact that uh, we're uh, not like a lot of the other cities that are experiencing tremendous amount of, of violence. Um, and uh, we're blessed to have the training and the experience uh, throughout all the different police districts. Are we perfect? Of course not, but um, and can we always make strides to be better? Absolutely. And I think that uh, this hearing will be hopefully part of that. A uh, couple quick questions, um, getting a lot of feedback from, from, uh, from constituents and families living in and around the Mass and Cass area. Um, they feel that one of the best tools uh, to date has been the BPD bike patrols, the pedal bikes there. So um, I understand that uh, there's, there's been a cut um, as part of that effort to reduce the overtime budget. So we'd love an opportunity to see if we can get that restored, particularly now as the warmer weather is here and uh, they play a critical role. And also uh, maybe to one of the superintendents, if they could maybe shed some light on really on the court overtime piece. Um, saw it a lot as an assistant DA, saw it also as a defense attorney. Uh, they'll do first call of the list um, and they may be a preliminary default entered uh, and then our second call of the list, the default will be entered and then obviously the um the offices are, are, are released they're free to go and then shortly thereafter um you know the uh defendant appears in court um and they immediately remove the fault and they schedule another date which means and then a whole other set of summonses so i don't know whether or not it's a function of how how that system's created or if there's something that the court can also do to pot potentially sort of stave off those costs because each time an officer is summoned into court um, due to the contract, uh, I believe it requires four hours. And in situations where we're seeing, um, you know, just repeated defaults that occur all across the county um, in, in the district courts, uh, what can we do um, to prevent that? And again, that's another factor that I think plays a role in overtime. So I'd like to hear from your perspective as to what can be done and what, um, what partnerships may need to come to the table here to stave that off. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Um, good morning. This is Superintendent Marcus Settings. Um, just, just to let you know, we, when officers get summons into court, um, there's no, it's no way of determining whether it's going to be a default um, or not. But we're very cognizant of the fact of the hours that officers get paid but not worked. And we do work with the district attorney's office to minimize those, minimize those hours by um, ensuring that notices for cancellations um, in cases uh, issued in a timely fashion by making efforts to ensure that the officers are not subpoenaed for to appear for a case where they're not required to testify or where there's no purpose for the officer to appear. Um, we also try to have the ADAs schedule more than one case if they know it's going to be something that's going to be quick. So if they can handle more than one case on a particular day, they're, they're able to do that. But as far as um, whether a case gets um, canceled not canceled, but a default is is um, going to be issued, or whether the defense attorney calls in for whatever reason and says he's not going to be able to make it that day. We really don't have any control over that. But again, we are cognizant of the fact that officers do get paid for hours that aren't working. We try to minimize that by working with the DA's office. Great, and then uh, and uh, just an answer on the pedal bikes over massive gas. And then just my last question: um, Have any of the and I, as a citywide council, obviously there's 22 wards and um, 255 precincts. Has any one neighborhood or police district seen heavier cuts to their day-to-day -day operations um, due to the effort to, uh, to to rein in some of the overtime costs? I want to make sure that there's no part of the city that's left unprotected at any time. Councilor, no, this is this is Kevin McGovern. This there's been no cuts to uh, to day-to-day -day service. We we do keep a, a minimum manning staff at uh, at each district, which is you know probably probably adequate for for day to day obviously if we run into situations where there's significant uh, issues going on we we might have to draw from other districts in uh, in, in the form of an emergency deployment um, but that also dovetails pretty well with the uh, with the bike unit and some of these citywide units uh, if we do have 
an event in a, in a particular district that's unexpected. Uh, the, the, the advantage of having a citywide unit is that we can we can direct some of those resources over there. Uh, I, I, I do acknowledge the, uh, yeah. the, the, uh, the bike unit over at Massive Cast. It's been uh, it's been great to have them over there. They they do they do really really outstanding work, and we can also use them in other areas of the city as needed. So so have, having the citywide perspective for some of these units and it gives us the flexibility that we need uh, typically without creating overtime. So. Uh, so that, that is an advantage uh, in, in, in those respects. And, and I do commend the, uh, the bike unit for, for the work they've done at Mass and Kess. Thank you, Superintendent. And uh, thank you, Councillor Bark. Thank you, Councillor Flaherty. Sorry, my video just went off. Um, next up is Councillor Edwards. Councillor Edwards? Councillor Edwards, you're still muted. One second. Um, can you, we can, can you hear, hear me? You. Yes. Okay. I can hear you and see you. Okay. Um, just a few seconds. My apologies. I'm trying my best to, um, okay. So my apologies. Sorry. It's what happens when you have 25 freaking zooms and trying to pay attention. So. I, I wanted my question to be very distinct about possible solutions. Can you hear me? All right. So one of the questions I had, I guess, for the police officers, I brought this up several times and I'm bringing it up again with some of the overtime hours and how they can be redelegated to other members on the police force um, or within your, within your control, such as crossing guards. Um, we talked about this. This seems to be dismissed and redismissed. But I'm still wondering why when it comes to street work and standing by potholes or standing by certain um, traffic issues, why we aren't using other members of the force that may be cheaper in their overtime and may actually need some additional um, hours. So that's one question. Number two, I, I think the special events has been thoroughly vetted by Councilor Royo. Um, I do hope though, and, and I apologize, Councilor Royo, if you did ask for this, I, I would love for the special events numbers uh, to be broken down by date so it's very clear what was a protest and what was a, a concert or what was something else i mean it looks like because we didn't weren't allowed to have concerts and uh, gatherings most of 20 most of last year that this would have been almost overwhelmingly protests but i still think i'd like it by date and then finally um i also noticed that there is a uh, the major majority of the you broke down by district which i appreciate it so district two seems to have the most overtime hours and I'm curious as to whether that is, is it, what is that related to? Were there more protests in District 2? Was there just more construction in District 2? Um, and how, how that, that correlates? So regarding the, uh, the use of police officers for construction, that, that, that's not overtime. Typically, that would be, uh, that would be details, which isn't, isn't wrapped up into these numbers that we're seeing here. Uh, would, the only time you'd see a police officer on overtime or, or, or even on, on regular straight time uh, standing by at, at, at some scene out in the street is if, if it's a crime scene or if it's a sudden event where, you, you know, a, a, a pipe exploded or, or something, and it was a, an emergency public safety issue. Once actual work is done and the permits pulled to, to fix those issues, then, then it becomes a detail, which, which is not paid for uh, directly by, by the department. Um, is, so, it, is it paid for by the department or paid for by the city of Boston if it's for public ways and things that we own, the city? Uh, for example, I get it for, for private development. The developer pays for that over time, but when it comes to um public ways or just improvements um who pays for that what the contractor that's doing the work would pull the permit and that's wrapped up into their contract uh so so if it's a if it's a you know a road that the state is paving or a bridge that the state is is doing it's i suppose indirectly paid for through that contract so the the, oh. the public ways it's it's it is at some point for those jobs public money versus a utility that's improving their infrastructure that would be that would be private money you know paid for by the utility contractor so so it depends on what work is being done on the public way whether it's you know indirectly public money or if it's if it's private money but still on a public way so so i guess it varies by job who actually okay. pays the bill so on just that. To, so just to make sure i'm clear then for a public way um with a private contractor if public dollars are going in there that 
public dollars are paying for that over time. Indirectly, not, detail, not through the, the yeah, I mean, not through the, that still wouldn't be over time by the police budget. That would still be a detail, but, but at, at some, at some way, shape or form, whether it's a federal highway grant or whatever it is at some point uh, going to be public money. Yes. Yeah. But I think what, it, what I guess I'm trying to suggest is even in as much as a police detail is there, it costs more than maybe say a crossing guard or someone who is, who is unionized and also within the BPD. So uh, why hasn't there been movement? I'm not sure if that's accurate. I know that's been studied before with uh, with flagmen. And, and again, this doesn't relate to overtime, but just from what I've seen uh, explored before, uh, say the use of a, a laborer at, at a construction site as a flagger, I think would get the prevailing wage, which is our the, the detail rate for Boston police officers is much lower than the overtime rate. So uh, I, I think the prevailing wage would be comparable, maybe, maybe more. So it's not, uh, I, I don't think we could pay I don't think we can pay a crossing guard their regular rate to stand at a street and in, in, uh, in direct traffic. Uh, yeah. Maybe yeah. we should get those numbers Marcus, then broken just, down. Well, um, this is Superintendent Eddings. I, I'm, I'm going to echo what um, Kevin said. The, the prevailing wage law in Massachusetts re will require that a minimum amount of $50.42 uh, be paid for any, any person working as a flagman. Our, our, our wage right now for uh, fill, fulfilling a detail is $46. Um, so the prevailing wage is actually higher than it would be for a police officer to man that, that particular detail. The prevailing wage in Boston is $52.42 an hour? No, $50.42. And that's according to the mass.gov site. That's, I don't, I think I'm, I'm trying to make sure I, I'm very clear about that prevailing wage number. Yep. Um, maybe we should get a little bit more and it's mass.gov, not the city of Boston. No, it's at, it's at the mass.gov site, which okay. it, it talks about prevailing wages. And mm -hmm. the prevail, prevailing wage at this point in time is $50.42. Councillor Edwards, it's prevailing wage for this activity. And because of the way it's pegged to police, it's basically, it makes it so that you can't really replace police on details without with civilians without it being a comparable wage. It happens to mean that, of course, if they were civilian um, flaggers, that they would be very well compensated once. That's that it's not prevailing wage. People watching at home should not think that that's the state's calculation for all working. Right. Okay. That's, also, that, that's that, 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 that also Thank does you. not that also doesn't include legacy costs such as pensions, health care, and other long term budget uh, costs. Uh, so, you know, for example, we don't receive um, paid sick time, vacation, work comp, liability, um, all that stuff is ancillary benefits. That would be required by using civilians or other performing uh, performing role of full time job. Okay, um, so I'll, I'll just leave. a lot of the questions I I wanted to ask specifically about the special events, which seems to be the biggest um, pull of your overtime hours, have been asked. I I do still would like to I would like to see how those hours uh, are broken down by date, and when they're used to shove them all into one. I think is, is, is confusing for us to be able to analyze where we can make some cuts. And I also think uh, what I'd like to hear um, from um, the police is specifically how they're going to be fin better financial stewards and helping to reduce that amount of overtime hours. Uh, what, I'm, what I'm hearing is that they're, they're necessary, but I'm not hearing any sense of we need to be restructuring or thinking about things differently and how we, um, we approach a special event or how we uh, are, are spending on these special events. Um, do, do, you know, there's, there's a, you know, we could talk about the approach and another hearing, but I do think that there's got to be, um, who's your financial watchdog and looking at these uh, overtime hours at all? I'm, I'm, you know, beyond us asking these questions, is anyone in BPD asking these questions? Yes, I think BPD is asking the questions, but you know, when this cut was made, you know, the, the intent, at least the, the publicly stated intent seemed to be that some of this work would be shifted to other people, public health or what have you. And that really hasn't seemed to happen. Uh, and, and I don't, you know, I, I recognize that's a difficult thing to do. But if we're going to reduce not only police overtime, but police involvement in some of these issues, it's, it needs to be a whole of government approach. It can't be we take the money from the police. And even if we give it to someone else, we don't have a corollary uh, reduction 
in, in the police involvement in some of these activities. You know, it, one example is, uh, you know, we've been in talks with the transportation department. They'll issue a moving permit and then we'll get a, the police will get a call that, that a car is blocking the, the moving access. The police get the call, the police get assigned to tag and tow that car at, you know, the, at the cost of an hour or maybe more of, of a police officer's time uh, when perhaps the transportation department would be the, the better route for that to go. Uh, that's just one example of, of, of many that we've discussed. So, you know, if, if, we're, if we're going to cut overtime and cut, cut budgets with the intent of shifting the work elsewhere, that that second piece of actually shifting that work elsewhere needs to happen. It, it should happen, you know, somewhat contemporaneously with, with the cuts to the overtime, but to, to just say, we're gonna cut the overtime and, and, and then look at us not performing those cuts as expected without other, without other structural changes, it's, it's not realistic. It's, it's gonna have to be well, this you know, efficiency-based approach. Right. I'm on record with Councillor Mejia and Councillor Wu actually pushing for those structural changes in that conversation, right? Looking at alternative or responses to 911 specifically. I'm so glad you gave that perfect example of one of the ways in which we can restructure with BTD. But I think ultimately our goal is to have a comprehensive conversation. So, um, you know, maybe when we do have that hearing, you can come with additional examples of where um, the uh, comprehensive structure shift can happen. Um, we'll top that first one at, at the top of the list, but then we'll continue to go down because I completely agree with you. There are times where we cannot simply ask you to not do and not earn and then not provide a structural response that will do and will earn. So thank you so much. I see the gavel. I see the eyes, eyebrows raised, Councillor Bach. Um, I, will, um, I will end my questions. Thank you. No, thank you. No, no, it's uh, the first time my timer went off, I was muted. So I, you got some extra time in there, Councillor Edwards. Thank um, you. Okay, uh, I, I think that's uh, a round through all the counselors. Um, so we're gonna go back up to the top and I think I'm gonna use my time um, just to run through a few of the things in these numbers. So um, start out, I just wanna, I just wanna share uh, this one again. Um, are you guys seeing an Excel? Is it zoomed in enough? It, yes, we can see it, Councilor Bach. And you can read it. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So this is this is um, a different page, that same one we were looking at before. Um, so I guess a question, so obviously here what we see um, is that the Bureau of Field Services is um, way over uh, the budget allocation in terms of hours. Um, I'm curious, we've talked a little bit about that and the just replacement costs driving that. Um, you know, it's really concerning. Um, and I, I guess what I want to underscore, it's concerning from a few fronts. I mean, one is that we're just not going to achieve any of the savings that were budgeted for um, this year uh, in the police overtime budget. And I think that's extraordinarily disappointing to this council. Um, I also think that, uh, and I think Councilor Arroyo alluded to this, you know, some of these other categories that are down um, of overtime, sorry, so flipping back briefly for folks, you know, things like the court time that's down or the special events that are down, even though there's been some special event right stuff, but in the wash it's down. Like if those go up again next year in a more regular year and we haven't cracked this like replacement cost thing, then you're, then if the department doesn't change its policies, you're gonna have an overtime budget that goes up into the eighties. I mean, it's just, like it's a really concerning driver from a fiscal perspective. And, you know, we don't have the budget office here today, but like, I mean, the next question is gonna be where that 15 million in overage that you guys are projecting is coming from um, in terms of us settling our bills on June 30th. So just really wanna stress, um, you know, how how frustrating it is. And I, and I know all of the uh, superintendent has and all the things that you've sort of entered into the record about why we are where we are, but it's just, um, from a fiscal oversight perspective remains really frustrating. I, I wanna ask about these, the departments that are, we might think of as more administrative that have these overages. So the Office of the Police Commissioner, uh, BAT, professional development, what's driving those ones? Cause I sort of understand what's driving field services. I'm um, saying with professional standards, although it's a smaller overage, but. The, the Office of the Police Commissioner, um, what, what, what possibly will be driving that overage? is um, that's where the community the out, outreach team, outreach street outreach team unit resides under the office of the police commissioner. 
Um, under the Bureau of Administration and Technology, the key driver for that 20,000 is upstairs our 911 operations unit. Um, and in the, uh, Lisa, yes. in the COVID response, that's where a lot of the janitorial staff lies and they, yes. when someone's exposed, you have to uh, respond and do all the deep cleaning and everything. And yep. they were quite busy. Correct. You're, you're right, Super. That's under the Bureau of Administration and Technology. Um, but I would like to point out that 911, um, you know, the, there is overtime up there because they're down significantly in heads and it, it takes some time to get call takers um, and dispatchers on board. So I, I think they're, they're short personnel, which is driving that overtime upstairs. Um, the Bureau of Professional Development Council, Councilor, I can say, is, is probably coming from, um, for the most part, and correct me if I'm wrong, Superintendent Hassan, but it's recruit investigations. So for example, and, this year, we're, we're doing there's a new class. Yeah, there's a new class. So there's, but there were two classes this year. And a lot of times, once the class is on, you'll see that level out as the year progresses. Because, you know, it, you know they're investigating the class, like say they were doing recruit investigations back in July for the class that came in in the, in the fall or in December. But because we have a second class, that would level out over time, you know, it smoothed itself out, but now it's gonna continue only because we're putting a second class on for June. So the whole recruit investigation process has started all over again. I mean, Bureau of Failed Services, it's um, replacement time um, and Bureau of Professional Standards, I'd have to get back to you on, on that slight overage. Well, that's the uh, Internal Affairs Division and they've been under a lot of Correct. Uh, de demand and, and stress to, uh, complete some of their investigations and a lot of uh, FOIA requests and they, they've been taxed to do perform extremely hard this year. So that's probably what's associated with that. All right, well, I guess, I mean, just a couple of comments. One would be that I think in terms of the impact of the police cadets class, um, Lisa, I, I would just say, I mean, I think we knew that there were going to be two classes this year that was baked into the FY21 budget. So that feels like the type of thing that we would ideally have budgeted for to the extent that it kind of right creates this additional um, investigative burden for that. But um, yeah, I think I think overall the um, I guess I guess my question is like, is the department taking any extraordinary measures to to cut costs in this remaining fiscal year? And, and then in terms of thinking about the following year, I mean, so far what I've heard is just, um, it's trying to, it's trying to get, you know, the involuntary retirements. And obviously if you did, what's, what's the number in that two and a half year, how, what number of officers is in that bucket, superintendent? Total, I think it's about uh, 35, right. uh, but I, I'd have to confirm that. I know we have uh, 22 currently in the pipeline at the retirement board, and three more go, three more going up by the end of this month, because it does take some time to compile the, that information. But and, and that number changes because someone that's been out injured, and they fall, you know, the longer they're out, they fall into that category. It's a rolling number. Right. I guess I would say that it seems like it. You know. To the extent that the department has a strategy on that, um, it's something that we could cost out in terms of, you know, these are the, this is the number of months that we would expect it to take this process to run through. This is the percentage well, of folks who we think will act. more than months, counselor. It's, you know, then they get the attorneys involved, and, you know, they know how to slow the process. It's, it's very difficult. Right. But I yeah. guess my point is, is what I'm not hearing from the department today, I'm not hearing any plan to, to sort of curb the rate of this number running into June 30th. But I'm also not hearing a plan that like really right sizes our overtime to what we've been budgeting for for even next fiscal year. So I, that's what I'm pushing you on. Well, the plan is to get people back to work, pursue all these avenues, try to um, engage other city departments with the alternative policing response, which I think is the key, but, you know, and we can't be the lead agency on that, but I think if we can have some successes in those, because we don't have the luxury to put, you know, close for the weekend here. We, you know, people call, we have to respond, like these special events, you know, they, they oftentimes the organizers set the parameters up on those. We don't, 
have any input that we, we just go in and assist and tell them how to do these things safely We're based on our you know the, the superintendent uh, McGoldrick's knowledge on how to publicly you know provide public safety for these large events so um, you know we don't have that choice we don't have that luxury you know a crime scene we're not we're not creating these things we respond to them Right. And I would just say, Superintendent, I think that the um, I think in some ways, you know, the frustration on the council side is actually I think that many of us in July said, you know, for these savings in the overtime budget to be real, there needs to be a kind of like structural plan. And and what I hear what I hear both you and Superintendent McColdrick and others saying today is like there wasn't a structural plan. So we haven't achieved the structural savings and they have to well, be. They have there to was be structural. a structural plan, uh, Councilor, but again, due to those demands, we weren't able to implement it. I would say relative to a structural plan, I, I think there are, there are certain fixed costs that, that shouldn't necessarily be fixed costs, but but they are because we're doing the best we can with, with the situation that's handed to us. You know, I'll take Mass and Cass as an example, uh, over $2 million just in staffing that. Obviously that's what the people in the neighborhood demand. And obviously very vulnerable population uh, requires some increased scrutiny in, in terms of keeping them safe. There are people that that recognize that there are people with, with mental health and addiction issues and people do prey on them in that area. So uh, unfortunately that, that has become a fixed cost on overtime, which, which maybe it shouldn't be, but there's no real way to extricate ourselves from that without impacting public safety quite negatively. Uh, the protests, that, that's the same issue. And, and, and there, are other, there are other concerns as well. COVID naturally, hopefully that goes away. But I, I guess the point overall is that the people and events and, and just events that, that may happen due to chance, planned events, unplanned events, those are all factors. We don't, we don't get to control. So to, to look for a concrete plan on how we're going to limit overtime, uh, it, it's not really something that's within the span of control of the police department. I mean, if, if we could if we could schedule every major protest uh, in the same weekend and, and have sort of, uh, you know, sort of economies of scale for, you know, uh, all of our offices to, to be in a certain place and structure protests appropriately, sure, that, that'd be great, but we, we don't have that capability. We, we go where the police services are needed. So uh, there are things that, that we can do to, to save costs, but a lot of what we're doing is on the margins. We really don't have the capability for a wholesale reduction on, on, on what is frankly an arbitrary number, not based on any kind of predicted events or any kind of predicted crime trends. You know, that, that, that number wasn't based on anything like that. That number was, I'm not sure what it was based on, but, but certainly there'd be no way to predict those issues. So there's no way to tailor a concrete overtime reduction strategy to that number because those things are not within the control of the police department or, or most other cities. I suppose in taking a whole of government approach, uh, we, we could take take the approach when people start applying for permits again that we would deny permits, we would limit events, we do certain things that would cut down on police overtime. But I don't think that's the direction we want to go as a city. I mean, certainly the, the police are going to support whatever events we need to support. Uh, that that rarely is our choice. Usually we're reacting to conditions that are established elsewhere in city government or outside of government. So um, I, I think, unfortunately, some of these numbers are numbers that defy uh, predictive analysis and and defy uh, real cost cutting measures. Uh, the ones that we do control, I, I think we're we're trying to control, um, but but I wish there was a better way to to kind of schedule things and and, and address things without uh, incurring overtime. But I, I'm I'm not sure what that would be. Thank you. I, I think that the issue is that you know on a city budget front, I mean we make we make budgets with our best you know our best guess of what we're going to need for in different areas, and yeah, we live within our means, right? I think I think in some ways the exercise for the police department is to imagine that it cannot run over. Like we budget for the office of food access, and there might and you know and we're trying to base that on what the food need and support in the city is, but one year it might come up short, and it's only the police who are able to just run over like this. And I think. You know, and and absolutely, you know, to come to the council and say, oh, we need more resources this year because of X, Y, Z. But I mean, it doesn't it doesn't strike me that it's so out of the realm of us being able to know that it's categorically different from all of the other hardworking civilian departments that do really important work for the city and that yes, cannot always predict the future. I mean, I just think that we've got to. 
Yeah. I, I think the police deal primarily with the variable of people more than any other entity in, in the city government, certainly on the scale that, that we deal with it. So I think that variable is hard to predict. I think if anyone predicted a year ago what the police would be dealing with, they would have been 100% wrong. I think they, the attitude toward police took a dramatic change. The willingness to go out and protest and, and cause police to have to react. The, uh, the election uh, the election issues that, that caused such uh, concern throughout the country quite reasonably uh, required police response. So those things could not have been predicted. And, and, I, and I would say that that does have an impact on the budget. And if we were to establish a firm line of budget and, and not exceed it, I think we would have no choice but to sacrifice public safety, which is not something that we would do. I think we all saw what happened at, uh, at the Capitol protest turned into a riot, turned into something much worse, which made the whole country look bad on the world stage. Uh, that is not a position that I'm inclined to put the police department in because of a, a budget number. Uh, if, if, if we're told to do so, then, then I think it would be ill-advised. I, I just, I just would say, I think, you know, every time that our public schools hit up against a limit, you know, we can see that as sacrificing public education when public works can't fix things. I mean, it's just like we operate in a, in a city constantly against these challenges, but I, yeah, I, I, I certainly hope having, that, public, like you know, said, that the public schools are more predictable and how right. they run their day to day than the police department. I, I know there's, there's, there's many excellent educators who can shape their environment much more effectively than, than the police department can shape their environment in the city. So I, I, I'm, I'm not sure I, I, I think that that's, I don't think that's a valid comparison, I guess. Thank you, Superintendent. I think I, since I'm the chair, I'll, I'll restrain myself and uh, and go to the go to the next counselor. Um, I just want to put a couple numbers on the record for the public, just and I won't pull the screens up for a short time. So I think, um, and I just want to confirm them with you all. So you guys sent us overtime um, hours, and for the sort of overall overtime hours worked versus not worked, it's almost all worked. It's like 99.4 percent hours worked, and only. 0.6% hours not worked. Yep. Um, but then on court overtime, and, and I think Councillor Flaherty raised this, but I just want to underscore it on, and now I'm looking for the Excel. On court overtime, it's like two thirds of the court overtime hours are hours not worked and one third are hours worked. Um, and I think that, that ratio has been going up in the wrong direction over the last few years. Um, so just really want to underscore that that seems like a space where that issue of, of, um, of paying for hours. Not could answer that one for you. Y yes. And specifically for 2020 on uh, the pandemic, when everything shut down approximately around March, uh, there was basically no court. And the court started opening back up on a limited basis around October. So officers appearing on matters um, from October 2020 until the present I'm mostly appearing to give limited virtual testimony to the clerk magistrate uh, for purposes of resolving cases that, that have been backlogged, involving mostly nonviolent offenses where the victim involved is listed as the Commonwealth of Massachusetts or uh, domestic violence cases. Uh, officers, you know, summons for more serious matters during that time were not always advised of cancellations on the cases in a timely manner. Um, so that being said, you know, I was the limited court and uh, um, the hours worked against hours actually paid is going, it has been rising um, since 2020. Significant, I think it's somewhere around 60%, but you know, again, we're cognizant of that fact and we're trying to rectify it. Great, thank you. Um, all right, I'll, I'll stop myself um, and go to Councillor Campbell. Councillor Campbell. Um, thank you, Councillor Bach. And I just wanna lift up what you stressed, which is that we should all be concerned, frankly, um, including officers and, and, and civilians working in the police department, all of us, um, because this just isn't sustainable. Um, you know, we have realized this was almost a test, right? We, to realize uh, the commitment made by the administration to save or to reduce the overtime budget by 12 million. And we've realized zero of that, even with court appearances, special event overtime numbers going down with federal dollars coming into the police department. Um, and so of course, all of us, including the, the CFO of the city must be concerned because we're gonna have to be extremely fiscally conservative going forward and coming out of COVID-19, um, given just the economic devastation in the city. Um, so I just wanted to echo that because I, it, it is extremely disappointing, but it's absolutely concerning uh, as well. Um, I, I will just, uh, 
sort of put out some record requests. Councilor Buck, what would be helpful is, and we don't have time for this hearing to do it, is to get a breakdown, not just, I know Councilor Edwards asked about dates, but for me, even more specific. So the special event numbers, the court appearances, more details, not just on dates, but what the events were, the details of the events, for example, um, any further detail on those numbers would be great. More detail on not just the Bureau of Field Services, but all those numbers where the overtime uh, went over. Um, if we could get a sense of the why and more details there. I know Lisa, you were talking about, uh, you gave some details here, but anything that the department can send over would be really helpful. Um, and then I just have two other questions. One was just, or I guess three. One, what percentage of details actually account for overtime in the department? The second is the federal dollars that we received, did any of those dollars go into overtime? And then lastly, and if so, what percentage? Those are my two questions and I have one more. No, no details nope. should result in overtime. I, I don't, I don't, I don't track the federal dollars. I don't know if uh, BAT would have an answer for that. Yeah. I know that from OBM, roughly $4 million was get from fiscal year 20 was get, getting moved off the operating budget from overtime. Some, some of it was being reimbursed from FEMA and some of it was being transferred over to the CARE grant. And I believe we have the CARE grant through 1231 2020. So I'm not sure how much um, OBM will be allowed to move over to the CARE grant for fiscal year 21. That $4 million was specific to fiscal year 20 counselor. Any, I guess any breakdowns on how federal dollars were used from the care packages or resources we received would be helpful, but I'll, go ahead. I'm sorry. I, I think Not right now, but as a follow-up. Um, and, and if any percentage of those dollars went to overtime, would be helpful. Most of it did. Most of it did. With respect okay. to the FEMA reimbursement, it was, it was all COVID related. I can tell you that um, Mary Ryan and her shop spent lengthy hours pulling overtime sli slips because they were audited. Okay. Um, and there were many overtime slips that were not allowed by FEMA to be um, reimbursed. Um, the majority, I believe the overtime that was reimbursed by FEMA, if I'm not mistaken, was the overtime um, to cover the Boston Hope Hospital at the convention center. Okay. Um, and then my last question is, there are many folks in our current department who think that there is a way to make some structural changes to our department to realize overtime uh, reductions and to be successful in that endeavor. And not just, of course, moving units around to cover districts to, to ensure that every neighborhood, of course, is protected and safe, but also in looking at how we shift responsibility from the police department to others without still leaning on our police officers. This is to Superintendent McGoldrick's point, without still leaning on our police departments while we're doing that shift in responsibility. So has the department ever done a survey of some sort of employees in the department around their thoughts and ideas on how we might realize savings um, in terms of overtime costs? No, we've never done that. But we I do have informal discussions with the uh, well, the, the different various commanders who I'm sure mm -hmm. discussing, you know, have talks with their uh, people they work with. So uh, informally, yes, but not formally. So I just and I offer it up as an idea. I, I do think having as many employees in the current department, officers and civilians, be able to weigh in on, on this budget question that is before us with ideas or thoughts on how we might actually make it so it's more sustainable um, and how we reduce overtime would be really helpful to all of us. So not just, of course, folks at the top tier levels, our captains, um, but others as well. It's just a suggestion that I think if it was a formal process could be helpful to all of us. 
I agree, Council. I, I think that'll be I think that'll be a worthwhile endeavor, and, and I think there's obviously some great ideas at all ranks in the department. Certainly, sure. I mean, certainly at the patrolman level, uh, we engage with the union leadership, who who has pretty uh, pretty candid dialogue with our members, and they do filter up some some information to us. But but perhaps a broader approach and a more formalized approach would would uh, would yield some results that perhaps we haven't thought of. Thank you, and thank you all, and thank you, Councilor Bach. Thank you, Councillor Campbell. Um, before we go to Councillor Sabi George, I'm just going to let um, Larry Calderon um, from the Boston Police Patrolmen's Association um, speak. I had said he could testify by noon, and we are there. And then I'll also just ask councillors um, who are remaining for a second round to really whittle your questions down just efficiently. And because um, I know the department's also got time constraints, so I'd love to get them on the record. Um, but you know, we may have to follow up with some things afterwards. Uh, Mr. Calderon. Uh Good afternoon now, Councilor, and all the councilors and everybody from the command staff that's here. Uh, thank you very much, Councilor Bach, for, for getting me in. Uh, I'll, I'll try to answer some of the things from the standpoint of the members that I represent, uh, as well as the department uh, who's spot on in everything that the superintendents have been saying. Um, I'll start with the details, Councilor Edwards. Why don't we use um, other entities for potholes? Uh, it's that type of lack of information that exists out there. And I'd really be happy to sit down with any counselor or the council as a whole to talk about paid details in the city, because what we actually provide by in that service is public safety. A couple of quick examples that I can point to is a, an officer involved in a brief struggle over a radio call for a person with a gun that that firearm was recovered and removed from the streets. And another incident, a laborer at a job site uh, had a slab of concrete fall off and had his arm trapped between the concrete. Not only did the two officers rush over and pick up that slab, but they simultaneously summoned EMS from their department radio and were able to provide first aid to that injured person. In another incident on Causeway Street, a shots, shots were fired and a call came out with a card description. Detail officers notified units that were dispatched. The car was stopped and illegal firearm was recovered and three suspects were put in custody. This is just a touch of the services that the city of Boston received from police pay details day and night on the street. And frankly, the city of Boston, its citizens, the council, myself, we're enjoying three, four, 500 police officers on the street daily paid for by private services. Um, I'd also like to commend Superintendent McGoldrick when he brings up the 79 ordinance. That ordinance states 2,500 people within the police department should not fall below. Um, I think his number was somewhere around 2,100 that we stand today for sworn personnel. I'd submit to you that just by the numbers the super provided, they have doubled. The population in the city has doubled since 1980. It has doubled our calls for service, but yet our numbers have gone down for sworn personnel. I don't understand how we can continue to do more with less. Uh, we, we're looking to cut an overtime budget. I, as respectful as I can say it, I think we need to stop this charade of, hey, we can cut police services by, collecting the, by cutting the overtime budget. The city of Boston had a $3.61 billion budget for fiscal 21. Surely we can budget the appropriate amount of money for the police department. If we historically go in the red by 12 or $15 million every year, then why isn't the city council or the mayor's office or whomever creates the budget just giving us adequate funds to provide those police services? It's silly that I listen to Councillor Flynn sit here and he's begging for more police officers in his neighborhood. And I'll go on the record by saying that many of you councillors have also asked for that same service. In fact, the department many times have hired multiple units of overtime to provide police services specifically for city councilors that have requested them in their neighborhoods. So I sit here and I find myself in a different position than normal. We are woefully understaffed. We can't cut the police budget if we're not giving adequate budget to begin with. We're not gonna stop investigating crimes, homicides, sexual assaults, crimes against children, you're rather what some people might call basic quality of life issues, the B&Es, the simple assaults. We, we can't stop policing. So I, I guess I'm going to ask, hire four or 500 more police officers or increase the budget to an adequate amount. Because in my 26 years, I keep hearing the same complaint. The police department goes over budget and we're continually asked to do more with less. And it just can't continue. Um, I, I applaud everybody for the job that they're doing. I know some of you counselors are are fairly new. Others have been around a long time. 
But I'm sure if we all sat at the table, unions, command staff, elected officials, we could have a serious conversation about how to do better for the citizens of Boston. So I, uh, I want to thank all the men and women out there that are answering the calls for service daily. They're doing a tremendous job. COVID has taken its toll on everyone. Uh, and that's all police officers, the rank and file I represent, the detectives, the federation, the command staff, as well as yourselves, counselors. Um, Councilor Buck, I, I truly appreciate you letting me get on here and share my information. And if I can provide any information further down the road, please reach out to me personally. I'm glad to come in with anybody that wants to talk. I thank you. Thank you, Mr. Calderon. Um, and, and I will just note that the department did, well, the city did in the FY17 budget, true up the police overtime. So we had been consistently running over and it, it increased the overtime number by, I think it was 10 or 15 million in order to make it kind of real. So what you just suggested, this was back in 17 and then the department promptly ran over that substantially. So I do think we have a problem here about kind of induced demand. Um, but I, I wanna know now to Councillor Asabi George. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I hope I'm not cutting any colleagues in line. Um, earlier in uh, testimony, it was mentioned the number of officers who are currently out injured. And I think it was Superintendent Hassan who said, um, Hassan, you mentioned that there's a number that have been out two and a half years or more. How many are out two and a half years or more from that? I think it's a 270 number. Okay, uh, Councilor, uh, yes, I'll just start adding the numbers up here, I'm sorry. Oh yeah, no worries. Uh, let's see, 12, 18, 20, 20. I, I'm, I'm feeling- 50, uh, 55. That 55 or two, two and a half years out. And right. of, that, of that number, you know, I know a number of them through my work um, regarding officers shot, shot in the line of duty that there are, uh, there are some officers who were shot in the line of duty who will very likely not return to work. Um, yep. Of that 55 number, how confident are you? What's the number that you're confident about that will not return to work? Um, we're pretty confident that most of them will. Okay. Yep. And, that, and that analysis will be done by the uh, medical board, you know, par like, uh, par par Brian, yeah, Parak and so they go through the, you know, they'll wind themselves through the system and uh, be analyzed and scrutinized as they go through. But uh, and I'm not sure if this was um, if this is in that analysis that we I know we have in our inboxes. I haven't looked, so you can just tell me if it is or if it isn't. Do we know um, what overtime is attributed to officers who are, who are out injured um, versus? officers um, overtime that's filled because officers may be at court or um, there might be some sort of special assignment. Is that included in that data that we have? It's not, not included, but we could uh, easily tease that information okay. out. Okay. You know, I, I think back to, um, again, Councilor Flynn's point earlier, we do need to make sure that we have the right number of uh, sworn officers, the appropriate number of civilians doing the work that civilians do um, when it comes to the police department. And I think all this analysis um, and some of the information that was shared today and has been shared in previous hearings will hopefully get us to that right number and I think have a more robust conversation. Because I think you know some of this conversation is uh, repetitive of what we talked about, I think in the fall, uh, Chair Bach. So I think it would be interesting to get to a point um, where we're not just simply sharing some information, but getting to a point where we're, um, I think, making some decisions in a different way. And, and certainly our budget process coming up will play an important role in that. Uh, but thank you, Madam Chair. And, and thank you, everyone who's joined us today and who has uh, participated in the hearing and for the information that's here and um, coming soon. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Sabi George. And yes, Councillors O'Malley and Flynn waived their um, second round questions, so that's why we jumped to you. Um, and I'll just say for folks that I agree with Councillor Sabi George that the budget's going to be an appropriate place to talk about those sort of decisions and next steps, and that I would expect that the sort of next quarter version of this overtime hearing is just going to be rolled in with and co-noticed with our budget process because it's really it's really is about sort of what action we're taking. Um, so I think that uh, next up is um, 
Councillor Mejia, and then it's Councillor Arroyo, and then Councillor Edwards. And I think that finishes out our our current set of folks who still may have questions. So, and then uh, I do want to let the department go. So. Thank you. Thank you, because we do have other. Yeah. So I'll, yeah. I've asked, I'll ask colleagues to just be brief, and if your question needs follow up, we'll follow up after. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Mejia. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Councillor Bob. I don't have any other questions. Um, I do want to just follow up via email. Councillor Mejia, we're, we're having terrible time hearing you. Can you? Yeah, I know. I have really bad internet. It's all good. I don't have any more. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry about that. Um, Councillor Arroyo. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm just going to leap right into this for, for time. Uh, so one of the questions that I have is about the injury procedures we're talking about. Um, when folks go out on injury, uh, you talked about trying to, if they're not coming back, trying to get them off or forcing them into retirement. Uh, I have questions about this process. So when they get into this process, is the timeline five years for them to essentially get healthy or get back on the force? And then they're automatically phased out at five years. Is that the process? No. So Again, this is just something that's been implemented due to the, uh, you know, trying to meet this uh, goal of overtime reduction. And so it's uh, two and a half years, but it's not just a number counselor. It's a review of all their records from their medical, uh, from the medical profession that they're seeing. It's from uh, conversations, it's, you know, projected, uh, <laughs> possibility so and then we take all that into into account and then determine maybe the best course of action here would be to uh move forward with uh retirement and so i'm assuming that when that's happening officers that are going through this process the only reason they're still going through the process and not going through the retirement process is because they're saying i can get back into the force or i can i want to get back to the force eventually is that is that the process here is it kind of a push where the force is saying, we don't think you can come back or we don't think you're medically cleared to come back. And they're in saying- some cases, In some cases. Yes, in some cases, yes, on that. Okay. And in other cases, is it officers who are saying, I'm trying to retire or is that a completely yep. different- some, Those are some of the cases as well, Councilor, yep. Okay, I'm just trying to figure out how this works. So once an officer has an injury and says, I know I can't come back to the force, are they immediately retired or put into on disability or what happens in that window? Well, a lot of them. So a lot of them do it on their own because some of them, you know, some, some of these officers, they love this job and they just don't want to face reality that yeah, it's something you love, but you can no longer do it. So they kind of resist, but, um, but so we do assist anybody that wants to move out, you know, move on on their own. So, uh, but some just can't come to grips with, you know, unfortunately you can no longer do this job. And some people come back and then they make, and that realization occurs to them. So then, you know, we, we assist them with that. We, so okay. yes to all of that. Just done for the interest of time, uh, percentage of COVID, I, I know you said we could get those numbers. How many actual folks were out with COVID or on COVID protocol? Um, right, right now, counselor, approximately 60 um, officers are out. Um, unfortunately, Chanel, our occupational health director, is in another meeting at City Hall, so I've been texting her back and forth. But right now, it's it's approximately 60, but I can confirm those numbers later on for you as well. And so I wanted more than just the current. I know that we've had a whole lot of replacement hours, and I'm trying to figure out, just so that you know yeah. what to bring back later, what I'm trying to figure out is how many of those replacement hours are due to injuries other than being sick with COVID or being out with COVID protocol. So, so I wanted to just kind of get the percentage of, cause we keep saying COVID drew up, drove up the replacement hours. I'm trying to actually put a number on what that actually is. If COVID drove up replacement hours because people were sick with COVID we, or people were on protocol, I want those percentages. We could we just give you a ballpark on that. We didn't have a COVID. Um, you didn't track uh, why officers were out? Well, we did in some, some form what was that uh, yeah i'll have to talk to lisa about that but a lot of times they just put the replacement code and then they put covid so it starts to get mixed up 
so there's no there's no accurate accounting for how many people actually are out on COVID. Oh, yes. No, yes. no, we have that. We have it's that. Just, we have that, and we've yeah. tracked COVID um, replacement costs. We we have tracked that, and it's 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 accurate as far as we've tracked it. But what what the disconnect was with counselor is that. Um, you know, an officer would, would fill out an unprotected exposure form and go out. And this was early on too, um, but, but also there, there was a disconnect in reporting that information to the time clerk as just being out sick versus being out COVID related. I mean, we, we, we tightened those controls and we, we definitely tracked COVID replacement costs um, yeah. through, throughout since, since last March. Um, we, we've tracked COVID quite extensively. So we do have that information. It's just that they, they, we've been trying to tighten up where we sometimes find that the clerk will code an officer out sick when at the same time the officer really has reported a COVID exposure. And that's where we're trying to close that gap. And I think we've closed it pretty well. So we do have a lot of those numbers and those numbers are pretty solid and we can get those to you. Okay. And then if you could just also, when you get that to me, let us know when you figured out that you had this issue with when you try to basically clean up the coding, right? So that we know when we have sort of an unreliable timeline. So if it was March and April, but you figured it out by May, let us know when you, when you close yeah, that. I would think like that $4 million would be a good number to start from. We could probably get from January to, to date. But All right. Uh, a lot yeah, of times to, too, to, to, um, comes to what, what happens too, where it's, it's actually better for us, but an officer goes back to work um, and doesn't in, inform, you know, the time clerk puts them back to work, but doesn't inform mock health yeah. that that counselor has, that, that that officer has returned to work. We have since have protocols in place where there has to be communication between mock health to basically approve that return to work and that the information is disseminated down to the appropriate time clerk. So we've, we've done a tremendous amount of work to make sure that we've had controls in place. But again, early on, it was a learning curve for all of us. And, and I'm sure it was for everybody within the city department because right. you know the expectation was unknown at that time. But I mean, we, we've made tremendous strides in making sure that controls were, placed, controls were in place for tracking COVID, but more importantly, tracking when those offices return to work and making sure that our health was aware of those offices who have returned to work. All right, and not so everybody that had COVID was replaced on overtime. So, okay. So I just, I see the gavel. I want to make sure I'm respectful of the time. Uh, the one thing I'm going to say here is that, you know, unless something has changed, the city council is an oversight body and it's incredibly difficult to have oversight when we don't have data, when we're talking about, we got to up the hours and we got to up hires and we got this and we have that, but I don't get, you know, what Councillor Campbell was talking about, which is the raw data. I don't have how you calculate how many people have to be on the, on the, on the streets at any given time. I don't have how many officers we have calculated for each protest or rally. Last I checked, there was no insurrection in the city of Boston. So the fact that we ran up numbers for an entire week and we had phone calls with BPD where there was no intelligence that there was an actualized threat and a lot of this was just, you know, essentially for comfort. You know, when we have that, and I'm looking at real numbers, as an oversight body that's supposed to be overseeing the city budget, it's incredibly difficult to have any of these conversations without that. So since the next one's going to be tied into the actual budget, I would love it if BPD could explain how they do their staffing hours. Because unless we know how you do your staffing hours, we can't delegate actual dollars to that in any real way that would make any sense. So that's it. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you for BPD for being here uh, and, and, and giving us you know, the information that they're giving us. Uh, and if I can just get that COVID stuff after this, I'll be great. Thank you, Madam Chair. All right, thank you, Councilor. Great. Thank you, thank you, Councilor Arroyo. Um, and Councilor Edwards has waived questions. So I think we're coming to the end here. Um, I, and I don't see anybody on for public testimony. Um, if, if you are, uh, email shane.pac at boston.gov, Shane Pack, straight away, because I'm going to be gaveling us out in a minute. Um, yeah, I just want to say um, I, I really appreciate uh, all three of the superintendents and Lisa's time today, um, and also the data uh, and, um, and that you sent to us and kind of, you know, the continuing conversations about this. I think this was a, a major concern of mine back when we voted on the budget last June, was that um, was what the question of whether this cut could be realized. And actually that was part of the concern about, about making this cut deeper was the question of would it be a real cut? And if it wasn't, 
where would we end up on the rest of the city's fiscal side? And I think I, you know, I just want to emphasize that that's sort of where we find ourselves back is that, um, you know, the money come, comes from somewhere, right? And so it'll be pulled out of reserves. Um, it, it's it's a significant overage. It's so much so that it's like, you know, it's many of our other departments combined worth of money when we talk about $15 million. Um, so I just think it's going to be really important for the council to be having this structural conversation with the department about how we how we set targets that we can actually hit and talk about the ways in which those um, talk about the ways in which those are structured. And, and I agree that kind of having more understanding of of what goes into the minimum staffing levels and how to think about um, about about those resources and what we really need and where we can find efficiencies um, is going to need to be part of the, this fall the spring conversation. Um, but it's definitely dispiriting to know that we're not um, going to achieve any of those savings. Um, I am glad to hear about the work that you're doing, Superintendent Hassan and others, around trying to really tackle this um, this uh, long-term sick and injury leave problem. I just I can't emphasize enough when we're talking about like a hundred officers worth on the force. I mean, that's that's like you know solving that problem is like adding a hundred police officers um, and. And you know, having looked at the historical data you sent us, it's way out of league right now from where it's been before. Um, and it seems like that's even with even bracketing COVID. So um, I just think I think you know, uh, to Councillor Arroyo's point, um, the uh, hearings probably raised more questions for us um, than answers. But the you know, getting getting these questions on the table and this conversation on the table is an important part of the council's oversight role. So. Um, I'm, I am grateful to all of you and to the department for the work that you do. I know these are hard conversations. Um, and, you know, I think it's, it's just a hard thing for us as a council that every department has, um, has a reasons and rationale and important work that they do. And yet we're sort of stewarding the overall city budget and trying to think about how to do that responsibly in the interest of all Bostonians. So that's going to continue to be the charge of the ways and means committee here. Um, and uh, we look forward to further conversations. Okay, um, thank you, Councillor. Thank you so much, Superintendent. I don't see anyone here for thank public tes testimony, um, so I think uh, I think that um, uh, and we don't have anybody else signed up. So with that, I'm going to adjourn this hearing of the Boston City Council's Ways and Means Committee. Everyone, have a good day. Thank, thank you. you. Happy. Bye, everybody. Bye.